The House will come to order. Representative Luck will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance Mr. Gregorio, uh, please call the roll. Representatives Amabile, Arndt, Bacon, Representative Bacon, Baisley, Benavidez, Burnett, Representative Burnett. Representative Burnett is oh. Bird Bachenfeld Bradfield Caravale Carver Catlin Cutter Doherty Duran Escar Exum Golick, Geithner, Gonzalez Gutierrez, Gray, Hanks, Herod, Holtorf, Hooten, Jackson, Here, Judah, Kennedy. Kip, Larson, Montine, Luck, Lynch, McCluskey, McCormick, McKean, Representative McKean is excused, McLaughlin, Present, Michael Sinjane, Malika, Neville, Ortiz, Pelton, Pico, Ransom, Rich, Ricks, Roberts, Sandridge, Sirota, Snyder, Present, Soper, Sullivan, Tipper, Here, Titone, Valdez A. Valdez D. Good morning, Colorado. Van Bever. Representative Van Bever is excused. Van Winkle. Weissman. Will. Williams. Woodrow. Woog. Young. And Mr. Speaker. With 63 present, two excused, we have a quorum. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that the journal of Wednesday, March 31st, 2021, be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. Uh, members, you have heard the motion that the journal be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, that was really good. All those opposed, no. No! Thursday, but it's kind of like Friday. That's pretty good. I still have it. The motion is adopted. Announcements and introductions. Representative Neville and Representative Molka. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, members, if we could get your attention, please. Members, we have an important, an important announcement, so if we can get your, uh, your attention. Members, please direct your attention to the wall. Members, uh, Representative Neville and I are up here to make a, a very important announcement, and if I could ask for the picture to be displayed, thank you. We've created a new caucus, members. I'm not sure if you know, but on occasion I drive a 2017 Dodge Grand Caravan, Caravan SXT. This baby right here has 283 horsepower under the hood. 3.6 liter V6 and can tow up to 3,600 pounds. 
dual sliding automatic doors, bucket seats that fold down. I can fold one side down in 8.9 seconds. Both sides just shy of 30 seconds. That's because I have to run around the van, and so I'm sure like Representative Woog or the speaker could probably do that a little faster running around the van. But I'm about 20. Yeah, yeah, he's about 20, but just shy 30 for me. We want to be clear that this is a big umbrella of a caucus that we're creating. I drive a 2017 van. Um, we're willing to take, if you drive an 89 Astro van, we're willing to take it. Classic. Classic. Um, Back to the seats real quick though, I, I just want to make a point, they're, they are easy to fold down, they're numbered, they're, they're tabbed, so even Representative Colin Larson can figure out how to fold down those seats. <laughs> and, and just lastly, I want to be clear that this is a caucus, I don't want you to confuse us with a gang or like a one percenter biker gang or anything like that, we are a caucus, Welcome. not a gang, so we just want to make this announcement real quick. Yes, members, the, the mission of the minivan caucus is to change the perception around minivans. As you can see, minivans are not just for the soccer mom, they're for the legislator dad. <laughs> you know, but it is, I do want to warn, this is a, a very cool kids club. As we know, we used to have a representative Coleman who was a part of the minivan caucus, and then he became a senator. And he no longer has the minivan. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> so this is a very exclusive club. We have sliding doors, automatic sliding doors. So when I park next to Kevin Van Winkle, I don't have to worry about my kids dinging his doors. They <laughs> slide right on open. If you want to haul some drywool or some plywood, you stow those seats down and you got that. But when you got your most precious cargo in the minivan, the safety features are beyond comparable in the minivan. And on top of all that, you have all the safety features, the stow and go seating, but in front of it all, is 3.5 liters of Detroit muscle, so I can truly stow and go, baby. <laughs> we welcome you. We encourage you all to become part of the minivan caucus. This is going to change the perception around minivans for the future. Well, you know, members, uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate this new caucus. You know, with the third on the way, Emily and I are really thinking about whether or not, I'll come to a caucus meeting, I'll listen, I'll listen. <laughs> closely because we do need a new car. Uh, Representative Van Winkle. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minivan caucus, like the minivan or the mullet, Representative Neville. Business in the front, party in the back. I, I fully support this. This is a long overdue, members. Thank, thank you, Representative Mullet and Neville. Representative Ransom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, you know I had a lot of kids, and of course I drove a minivan for many, many, many years. And when I finally got down to about two kids, I traded it in for a used Honda, and my son, who was in high school at the time, got the minivan. And he said he was going to own it because he was very concerned about the other kids at school watching him. But here is a text that he sent me last year. The kids who drove minivans in high school are the backbone of our society. So pay attention, parents. It's a great thing to make your kids drive your old minivan in high school. It, they can't get up any speed, they're less apt to wreck it, and they're less apt to fill it up with partiers. So seriously, folks. Make sure your kids drive your old minivan when they're in high school. Further announcements on the uh, uh, Representative A. Valdez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I just had to get up here and join the minivan caucus. I, uh, as a child, was asked by my parents, What's, what kind of car do you want when you grow up? And I said, I want a Pontiac Transport. Does anybody remember those? That was the sweetest of all minivans with the huge front, pointy front. Uh, I never got it. Sad day. Uh, but I, one day, I'm holding out for a classic. Anyone knows where I can get one, let me know. It looked like a roly-poly or a bread loaf. Yeah, uh, Representative Michael Sinjane. Uh, you know, I think a minivan caucus like, is a good idea. I mean, I don't want to say anything bad about it, but I will warn you, if you're buckling your child into the car seat, do not hold the keys in your hand because the door may close upon you. So dangers of sliding doors. This is a dangerous caucus. I, I say buyer beware. All right, further, and we'll go to Representative Geithner next, and then we'll continue with announcements and introductions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and if I could ask uh, Representative Matt Gray and, to join and me. And Representative Gray. So, members, 
especially the minor or the majority, you may not be aware, but the minority's mascot is missing. Now this is given us great concern on my side of the aisle. We're distraught. Uh, and we would like to see our mascot return. And those of you that don't know our mascot, it is an elephant. It's a rather large elephant. Um, its name is Goliath, and it actually has quite an interesting history. But we di I did receive some intelligence last night that it is still in the building. I am also hearing rumors that there actually may be a ransom request. And so I think the minority is willing to pay a ransom in order to see our mascot returned. However, there is a condition on the ransom in which we would be willing to pay, and that condition is that it go to a nonprofit. I'm challenging the majority possibly to meet us, to match, and so there are two specific nonprofits that come to mind. The first one is Angels of America's Fallen. Uh, for those of you that don't know what Angels of America's Fallen is, uh, it's an organization that will take their proceeds and they actually work on behalf of fallen service members and first line responders uh, for purposes of their children and making sure that those children uh, that are going through that have the ability to take karate, um, have the ability to take an art class, have, have that type of, uh, of, of a support and outlet. Um, another nonprofit that came to mind um, is the National Alliance on Mental Illness or NAMI. Um, they do a lot of great work, and so I'm definitely in for $50 to see if, if we can't uh, get our mascot back. I think my caucus will likely join me, but remember, the condition is, is that the majority must also match or exceed, or exceed to those two organizations. And so I'm just hoping that we can get Goliath back soon. Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, I have no idea what happened to Goliath, <laughs> who is a very, very heavy statue. <laughs> and carry, I would imagine carrying Goliath uh, across several hallways and up a flight of stairs would be difficult if somebody did that. But I don't know, because I've never, I've never done it personally. But I do think that resolving the situation um, in the way the Representative Geithner has described, uh, it does make a certain amount of sense, and I will match his pledge and ask other folks to make uh, contributions as well, even though I don't even know what I'm doing up here, because I, <coughs> excuse me, I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> Representative Geithner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I do have something that I would like to display. I think it would help convey um, our understanding, and so, Mr. Speaker, if you would permit me to display uh, the picture that I have. Oh. Okay, so it was up. I didn't realize it was up behind me. Forgive me. Um, I, I, I believe, and Representative Gray, you'll have to tell me and confirm that that is actually your office. So I just, you know, I, I, I realize that you say you don't know much about it, um, but that's the intelligence that we were given. I have, I mean, I've blurred out the names, but uh, uh, your office, I think it's Representative Hooten's as well as Representative Luntine's. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of offices in this building, and they all have wood paneling, so this doesn't mean anything to me. Again, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm very happy to join you in, the, in, <laughs> Thank you. Thank in this effort. Thank you, Representative Gardner. <laughs> Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Mr. Speaker and, and Representative Caraveos joining me. Members, um, any of you that are vertically challenged, feel free to join us first, down first. at the well. Come on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm going to turn this over to Representative Caraveo. Representative Caraveo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, we. Um, April really maybe should be short people month um, based on this based on this tribute and so if Mr. Gregorio could please read this members this is a tribute if you could all stand <laughs> members we have a tribute in the well please direct your attention to the well Mr. Gregorio whereas Speaker Garnett is an imposing figure when presiding over the House of Representatives and where we all look up to him literally and where his stature is such that the stool at the spacious speaker's podium has been unmoved playing mind games with all short people who chair the cow. <laughs> and whereas he stands and head and shoulders above our 
something physically, <laughs> let it be resolved by the House of Representatives on this day that all future speakers shall be under six feet tall in order to ensure that Speaker Garnett retains his title as tallest speaker for eternity. Yes. That's, uh, it feels like this is all in order. Representative Caraveo. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all literally look up to you. Happy, happy April Fool's Day. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Very good. There, and for the body, there is a plaque in my office, which you're all able to come in and see, that says, I'm the tallest legislator in Colorado history. But there's an asterisk at the bottom of the plaque that says no actual research went into this finding. <laughs> so, okay. Announcements and introductions. Representative Beasley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I didn't get down here fast enough, but I recently looked up something that was very relevant to the announcement just made. If you would look in Wikipedia, and I'm not kidding, I'm reading this directly from Wikipedia, there is a something called heightism, height discrimination. It's a prejudice or discrimination against individuals based on height. In principle, it refers to the discrimination treatment, discriminatory treatment against individuals whose height is not within the normal acceptable range of height in a population. Various studies have shown it to be a case of bullying, commonly manifested as unconscious microaggressions. So it just seemed relevant to add to the, to the, the point at the end of that last presentation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been a long 38 years, Representative Beasley. <laughs> um, all right, further, and it is April Fools. Um, it's been uh, good. This has been a nice uh, change to announcements and introductions. Representative Will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. Honor to serve with you as well, Representative Will. Representative so this this isn't about April Fools, but we're getting close. Uh, the application deadline for big game hunting licenses is April 6th. So I want to make an announcement. Get your applications in. If you're a big game hunter, April 6th is the deadline. Representative Valdez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, today is April 1st, but uh, April 6th is a deadline for your applications. Make sure you can get them online and because there is a timeline and, a, and efficiency before everybody rushes in at the last minute. So please, uh, if you love to hunt, fish, be outside, enjoy Colorado weather uh, like today, put your application in and enjoy, enjoy your time in the outdoors. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Representative Amable or Representative Valdez. Representative Valdez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just have a non-funny announcement very quickly. Uh, today at 1.30, Energy and Environment, I'm being joined by my friends. Uh, at 1.30, 1 Energy and Environment is going to be meeting over in the Old State Library, 271. We're going to be hearing uh, 12.43, 006, and 11.49. Again, 1.30 if 130 works out in Old State Library. <laughs> Representative Amable. <laughs> Members, we have a, 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 a serious tribute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So this morning, uh, Illuminate Colorado brought us these pinwheels to remind us of what childhood is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about lightness and joy and sparkly things. And so I have a tribute to recognize today, the first day of April, as the beginning of Child Abuse Prevention Month. And I ask that this tribute be read at length. The House of Representatives convened in the 73rd General Assembly hereby recognizes the month of April as Child Abuse Prevention Month. Children are key to Colorado's future success, prosperity, and quality of life. COVID-19 has added stressors to the lives of parents and caregivers, such as loss of employment, loss of income, food insecurity, and school and business closings that necessitate new childcare and homeschool arrangements. The risk to our nation's children for experiencing child abuse and neglect in times of stress and uncertainty is high. We all play a role in strengthening families, and there are ways everyone can get involved to help prevent child abuse. Just one person has the power to make an extraordinary difference in the lives of both children and families. In addition to the hundreds of government and community-based nonprofit agencies working together to raise awareness and provide support to help children and families thrive, we pay tribute to unsung everyday heroes who implement those five protective factors that make families strong and prevent child abuse and neglect. Resilience, social connections, concrete supports, knowledge of parenting and child development, 
and social and emotional competence of children. The members of the Colorado House of Represent Rep Rep Representatives offer their heartfelt gratitude for the work to help Colorado's children. On request of Representative Judy Amabile, given this first day of April, 2021, State Capitol, Denver. Representative Amabile. Thank you. Uh, I'd, as Colorado leaders, we are more than just one person and the difference that one person can make. We're the difference that 100 people can make. And it is important that we work together to make our state the most nurturing place for children that it can be. You only get to have one childhood. And what happens to you when you're a child stays with you for your whole life. And if we can make a difference, if we can stop children from experiencing food insecurity, housing insecurity, if we can prevent drug abuse in their families, we will have made a difference in the lives of these children. So let's pledge today to help address these issues so we can assure that Colorado is a great place to grow up. Join me in raising a pinwheel to Colorado's kids. Let's do everything in our power to create a better tomorrow for their families and for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Amable. Representative Ricks. Good morning, members. Um, this month is Poetry Month, and I have a tribute to some Poetry Award winners that won in my district. I'm going to ask for the tribute to be read at length. House of Representatives, convened in the 73rd General Assembly, hereby extends sincere commendations to the District 40 Black History Month Poetry winners. The Colorado House of Representatives would like to congratulate all those who participated in the inaugural District 40 Black History Month Poetry Contest and recognize the winners. Enrique Brunette won first place, Ashade Badasso won second, Killian Kelly won third, and Sydney Brillhart received honorable mention. This contest was started in an effort to uplift the voices of those in the District 40 community and to, to support young writers throughout the Aurora community, and they did not disappoint. While this is the first iteration of this competition, we cannot wait to see what these young creative minds produce next. On request of Representative Nikita Ricks, given this first day of April, 2021, State Capitol, Denver. Representative Ricks. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, speaker. Um, good morning, members. Uh, April is National Poetry Month. It is meant to be a time to re remind the public of the importance of poetry in our history and culture. Back in January, along with the rest of the nation, I watched Amanda Gorman, the first ever inaugural youth poet laureate for the United States, read her poem, The Hill We Climb. I was particularly struck by the last lines of her poem, the new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. On that day, Amanda Gorman showed the country how important it is to uplift young people's voices and creativity. I wanted to help encourage more young people to express themselves, sort creatively, I'm sorry, to express themselves creatively and to comment on the issues they care about. In an effort to support emerging young writers in Aurora, my office developed the Rising Young Voices Spoken Word Poetry Contest. This year's theme was to write a poem responding to Black History Month. I cannot think of a better day to honor the winners of my office poetry contest than the first day of National Poetry Month. Enrique Brunette's poem, Year I Am, is a lovely expression of being comfortable in one's own skin. El Shade Besado is entitled, I Am From Black Woman, is a beautiful nod to the people, history, and culture that have shipped, shaped her identity. Kylan Kelly, The Princess Within Me, is a joyful celebration of inner and outer beauty. And Sydney Brillhart's A Poem About Black History Month is a wonderful tribute to Martin Luther King and his legacy. Enrique Elshade and Kylan and Sydney are rising young voices. These four individuals have written poems that are creative, enlightening, and brave. I look forward to seeing what they will write next. Please welcome our poetry winners and their families from Aurora to the People's House, our state capital.
Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Representative Ricks, and welcome everyone, and congratulations. Further announcements and introductions. Representative Will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I kind of wanted to lighten the mood here again for April 1st, but, uh, you know, I, I grew up with Bob Hope and Steve Jobs and Johnny Cash, and uh, it seems now that there's there's no jobs, no cash, and, and no hope. So I just I just pray that... Uh, <laughs> No, I do pray that nothing happens to Representative Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Holtorf. Mr. Speaker, I want to be a little more optimistic than my colleague from Rifle. Now, there's something very significant happening today, ladies and gentlemen. Major League Baseball opening day. <laughs> Woo! Now, I want to talk a little bit about Americana. What is Americana? Baseball, apple pie, 4th of July. Saluting the American flag. I will tell you, those are the definitions of Americana that I celebrate as a proud American. And baseball is a part of our history and a part of our legacy. I never want those key components of America and what makes our country gate to be canceled out. We need to continue to celebrate what makes us Americans. And let's go Rockies. They play the Dodgers at 210 at the baseball field. And according to the majority leader, we're not going to get to go because we have to work. Representative D. Valdez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Holtarf, let's go. Let's go. Let's play ball. All right. All right. Well, I look forward to the joint resolution to the Rockies management on the Arenado trade. <laughs> Majority Leader Eskar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm just sorry that none of us will be attending opening day. Just saying, just saying. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to proceed out of order for the immediate consideration of SJR 7. You've heard the motion, see no objection. We'll proceed out of order for immediate consideration of Senate Joint Resolution 7. Mr. Gregorio, please read the title Senate Joint Resolution 7. SJR 21-007 by Senators Rodriguez and Gonzalez, also Representatives Valdez A. and Tipper, concerning recognition of Cesar Chavez Day and honoring Dolores Huerta. Representative Valdez A. Thank Valdez. you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we move Senate Joint Resolution 7 and ask to be read at length. Whereas Cesar Estrada Chavez was born on March 31st, 1927, on a small farm near Yuma, Arizona, and was raised by migrant farm workers, and Whereas, during the Great Depression, Cesar Chavez's father lost his small farming business, and they, like many other families, became migrant workers. They joined some 30,000 workers who followed the crops from Arizona into Southern California. And, whereas, Cesar Chavez left school after the eighth grade to labor in the fields and vineyards of the Southwest to help support his family. And, whereas, in 1944, at the age of 17, Cesar Chavez joined the Navy and served his country. And whereas, after experiencing years of discrimination and unfair working conditions, Cesar Chavez dedicated his life to improving the plight of farm workers through struggle, self-sacrifice, and self-denial. And whereas, Cesar Chavez formed his own organization in 1962, the National Far Farm Workers Association, which later became the United Farm Workers of America, to help farm workers like himself win equal rights and fair treatment. And whereas, when recognizing Cesar Chavez, it is only right to recognize the accomplishments of UFW co-founder Dolores Huerta who <clears throat> for her work on behalf of farm workers and whereas Dolores Huerta brought forward a unique voice on behalf of women to ensure all workers had fair representation. And whereas in 1965, Cesar Chavez led a strike of California grape pickers to demand higher wages and urged all Americans to boycott table grapes as a show of support. And whereas Cesar Chavez believed in the principles of nonviolence practiced by Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and used tactics such as boycotts, marches, strikes, and fasts to lead a successful five-year boycott that gained millions of supporters and new members for farm labor unions across the United States. 
And whereas by 1970, Cesar Chavez and the UFW had persuaded grape growers to accept union contracts and had successfully organized almost the entire industry. And whereas during a fast in 1972, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta coined the phrase, si se puede, which in English means, yes, it can be done, reflecting their conviction that failure happens only by giving up on nonviolent tactics. And whereas the work of Cesar Chavez was informed by his devout Catholic faith and he traditionally included images of Our Lady of Guadalupe at marches and demonstrations and led supporters in praying the rosary. And whereas in 1975, Cesar Chavez and the UFW's efforts resulted in the California Agricultural Labor Relations Act, a groundbreaking law protecting the right of farm workers to unionize. And whereas Cesar Chavez tirelessly devoted himself to making all people aware of the struggles of farm workers and their need for better pay and safer working conditions. And whereas Cesar Chavez and the organization he co-founded with Dolores Huerta, the UFW achieved the following. The first collective bargaining agreement between farm workers and growers in the continental United States, and the first union contracts requiring rest periods, clean drinking water, hand washing facilities, and protective clothing against pesticide exposure, and the first ban on pesticide spraying while workers were in the fields, and the first ban on DDT and other dangerous pesticides, and the first and only performing pension plan for retired farm workers, and the first union contracts regulating safety and sanitary conditions in farm labor camps, and banning discrimination in employment and sexual harassment of female workers, and abolition of the use of the infamous short-handled hoe that crippled generations of farm workers, and extension of state coverage under unemployment disability and workers' compensation of farm workers. And whereas on April 23, 1993, Cesar Estrada Chavez died peacefully in his sleep in San Luis, Arizona. And whereas in 1994, President Bill Clinton posthumously awarded Cesar Chavez the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. And whereas Cesar Chavez influenced and inspired millions of Americans to seek social justice and civil rights for the poor and disenfranchised in our society. And whereas it is important to continue Cesar Chavez and Dolores Herta's legacy of advocating for the rights of agricultural workers, including efforts currently underway. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate of the 73rd General Assembly of the State of Colorado, the House of Representatives concurring herein, that we, the members of the General Assembly, honor a man and woman who devoted their lives to improving the working conditions, safety, and dignity of so many on the day that the entire state observes as Cesar Chavez Day. March 31st, 2021, while recognizing Dolores Huerta. Be it further resolved that copies of this joint resolution be sent to State Senator Rob Hernandez, who was State Representative Frana Mace, was the prime sponsor on the Senate Joint Resolution 99043, recognizing Cesar Chavez, State Representative Fran Coleman, State Senator Polly Bach, State Senator Abel Tapia, each member of Colorado's congressional delegation, Dolores Huerta of the Dolores Huerta Foundation, the Cesar Chavez Peace and Justice Committee, Dr. Ramon Del Castillo, co-founder of the committee and retired professor and chair of the Chicano and Chicano Studies Department at Metropolitan State University of Denver, Woodbury Library in Denver, the members of the Pueblo City Council, Cesar Chavez Academy in Pueblo, Denver Mayor Michael Hancock, and the members of the Denver City Council. Representative A. Valdez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We were, uh, Cesar Chavez Day was yesterday, but uh, we got a little hung up, so we wanted to make sure we came down here to honor his legacy today. Uh, we're celebrating uh, a man who you've just heard his accomplishments, how he advocated for farmers' rights, formed the United Farm Workers of America, and fought tirelessly for improved working conditions and better pay. Who would have believed somebody had to fight to stop spraying farm workers with chemicals? Uh, but he did. And these efforts opened up a seat at the table for workers, which led a seat to the table in other places, which led a seat to the table here in this building. He knew firsthand the struggles of the nation's poorest, the most powerless, but most dedicated workers. He knew what it was like to put food on the nation's table while too often going hungry, to work long hours and make as little as 40 cents an hour. And in the face of discrimination, determined to help those around him, he fought for equal rights and fair treatment. We cannot recognize Cesar Chavez's work without re recognizing the work of his UFW co-founder, Dolores Huerta, an integral part of the workers' rights movement and an incredible woman who used her position to uplift fellow fam uh, farm workers and their voices. This, holds, this work provides so much power to the change that we see today, but it also stands for so much more. They amplified voices of people who were powerless for the pride of Chicano and Latino culture, and I could not be prouder to recognize these 
uh, pioneers today. To forge a path ahead towards equality, social justice, and acceptance, they showed us that we must continue to forge ahead and create a new path and continue their work. In the United States, there are over 2.4 million farm workers, and 83% of them are Latino. These workers provide us with 50,000 agricultural workers in Colorado alone, and 21% of Coloradans identify as Latino. Plenty of people are continuing in Cesar's uh, footsteps, but as we go to work today, let's take on a memory of a man who fought, who fought for equality, who fought for fairness, who fought for the health and rights and pay of workers who put food on our table for generations. As Cesar would say, si se puede. Feliz cumpleaños, Cesar. Uh, Representative Benavides, Madam Speaker Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Matt, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, members, Cesar Chavez was not just uh, an icon in our community, but throughout the world. I first learned about him, and I attended my first march in the streets in the mid 70s for the United Farm Workers. Many of my friends worked for the Farm Workers Union. And when I say worked, these were young people that committed to work for $5 a month. And they ended up staying in people's homes and they went out and they got people to fight for the cause of the farm workers. I have, I mean, I think of Cesar Chavez every day. I have a carved, um, uh, uh, frame. It's not framed. It's actually decoupage poster that is carved on wood hanging in my kitchen that has been hanging there since uh, 1977. It's a poster that says boycott grapes across it. And that poster is also in the Smithsonian. So this is a man that is seen worldwide as an important figure in all of our lives. And when you think about organizing, you know, whether it's a campaign of any kind, we think about how we do that. When, when these people did this, they had absolutely nothing. They had no money, no resources, and they put together a worldwide campaign to get institutions to say, you know, what's happening to farm workers is wrong, and we need to support that. First came the lettuce boycott and the grape boycott. And it was talking to people face to face and getting them to understand what farm workers were going through. To get us all to that point to say, it's not okay for people to be treated in this manner. And that is why, at least for me, and I know many people, Cesar Chavez is an icon. He is someone to be honored. I certainly had the honor and privilege of meeting him on two occasions when he came to Colorado. He came several times. He stayed with, with the Gonzalez family on several of those occasions. Um, so he was a real person, and this work was hard. My roommate was one of those that worked for $5 a month to do that work. Um, so I know that here in Colorado, just this past weekend, the Cesar Chavez Peace and Justice Committee honored many people who are fighting for the ideals that Cesar Chavez promoted and continues to promote even in his death. So members, this is a important tribute that all of us should take pride in that our predecessors here in the legislature were able to put this on our statute books as a holiday and we should recognize that and continue to give tribute to Cesar Chavez. And I'll echo um, our chair, que si se puede. Representative A. Valdez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We ask for the adoption of Senate Joint Resolution 7. Uh, is there any objection to a voice vote? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Joint Resolution 7. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Joint Resolution 7 is adopted.
please open the machine for co-sponsors. Representative Tipper, I think you are a sponsor. Representative McLaughlin, Representative Snyder, co-sponsor. Representative Jackson, co-sponsor. the machine. The next order of business is third reading of bill's final passage. Mr. Gregorio, please read the title to House Bill 1121. House Bill 1121 by Representatives Jackson and Judah, also Senators Gonzalez, concerning protections for residential tenants related to actions by landlords. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move for the passage of House Bill 1121 on third reading final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1121 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Those participating remotely, Representative Tipper, how do you vote? Yes, yes. Representative Tipper votes yes. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Jackson votes yes. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Snyder votes yes. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? No. Representative McLaughlin votes no. Please close the machine. With 40 aye votes, 23 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1121 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Gregorio, please read the title of the House Bill 1051. House Bill 1051 by Representatives Geithner and Byrd, also Senator Pedersen, concerning publicly available information about applicants for public employment. Majority Leader Eskar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move for the passage of House Bill 1051 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1051 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Tipper, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Tipper votes yes. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Jackson votes yes. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Snyder votes yes. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? Yes. Representative McLaughlin votes yes. Representative, Madam Majority Leader. Representative Bockenfeld and Representative Ricks. Please close the machine. With 50 aye votes, 13 no votes, and two excused, House Bill 1051 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Gregorio, please read the title to Senate Bill 12. Senate Bill 12 by Senator Donovan, also Representative Roberts, concerning measures to create opportunities for persons who acquire experience in wildland fire services through inmate disaster relief program. Majority Leader Eskar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move for the passage of Senate Bill 12 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 12 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Tipper, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Tipper votes yes. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Jackson votes yes. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Snyder votes yes. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? Yes. Representative McLaughlin votes yes. Representative Doherty, Representative Exum, Representative Soper. Please close the machine. With 60 I votes, three no votes, and two excused, Senate Bill 12 is adopted. Co-sponsors.
Representative Tipper, McLaughlin, Jackson, Snyder, co-sponsor. Please close the machine. Mr. Gregorio, please read the title to House Bill 1108. House Bill 1108 by Representative Escar, also Senator Moreno, concerning updates to prohibitions against gender-based discriminations to clarify the individuals who are included in a protected class. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move for the passage of House Bill 1108 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1108 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine and members proceed to vote. Representative Tipper, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Tipper votes yes. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Jackson votes yes. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Snyder votes yes. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? Yes. Representative McLaughlin votes yes. Please close the machine. 41 I votes, 22 no votes, and two excused. House Bill 1108 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Representative McLaughlin, Tipper, Jackson, co-sponsor. Snyder, co-sponsor. Please close the machine. That brings us to general order, second reading of bills. Representative Gray. You have heard the motion, seeing no objection. Representative Gray will take the chair. The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be <coughs> read by title unless there's a request for a bill to be read at length. Committee amendments are printed and in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon the motion of the majority leader and the coat rule is relaxed. Mr. Gregorio, please read the title of Senate Bill 122. Senate Bill 122 by Senator Janal, also Representative Froelich, concerning the bulk purchase of opioid antagonists pursuant to a standing order. Representative Froelich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It is a wonder to serve with you. It is a wonder to serve with you as well. Um, <laughs> I move uh, Senate Bill 122 on second reading. Please proceed. Uh, members, there are two life-saving drugs in our war against the opioid epidemic. They stop um, folks who have overdosed from dying, so they're life-saving drugs. And in recognition of that, we passed a bill in 2019 uh, to open up a bulk purchase fund so that we could get these dr life-saving drugs into as many people's hands as possible. There was a little bit of disconnect between the bulk purchase uh, fund and the standing orders required. And this bill just cleans that up so that 
folks can get both standing orders and access to the bulk purchase fund, and I ask for an I vote. Any further discussion on Senate Bill 122? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 122. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Senate Bill 122 is adopted. <laughs> Mr. Gregorio, please read the title of House Bill 1218. House Bill 1218 by Representatives Duran and Bockenfeld, also Senators Danielson and Garcia, concerning organizational requirements to qualify applicants to be issued to the Colorado Professional Fire Li Firefighters License Plate. Representative Duran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move House Bill 1218. The bill has been moved to the bill. Representative Duran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House Bill 1218 will recognize over 5,000 men and women who are current or retired professional firefighters in Colorado. It will also recognize their career, service, commitment to the citizens of their communities, as well as the state of Colorado. It will also recognize the role professional firefighters play in serving as first responders to natural disasters, emergency medical fire, and all hazard emergencies. It also will raise funds which will exclusively benefit the Colorado Professional Firefighters Foundation, which awards grants, scholarships to active firefighters, retired firefighters, and their families across the state. I ask for a yes vote. Representative Buckenfeld. I'm honored to uh, co-prime sponsor this bill with Representative Duran. Any further discussion on House Bill 1218? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1218. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. As opposed, no. The <laughs> ayes have it. House Bill 1218 is adopted. <laughs> Mr. Gregorio, please read the title of House Bill 1223. House Bill 1223 by Representatives McLaughlin and Soper, also Senator Story and Quorum, concerning the creation of the Outdoor Recreation Industry Office in the Office of Economic Development. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1223, and uh, there were no committee report. To the bill, Representative McLaughlin. Yes, um, this bill, we talk a lot about uh, rural economic development, and uh, this bill does just that all over Colorado. Um, it is to codify and put in statute the... Um, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of going crazy here. Um, to put in um, the um, Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade and OREC, the um, Department of um, Outdoor Recreation. There were a couple of questions that came up in committee that I thought I should address now, um, just to give everybody a clear idea, and then I will have um, Representative Soper continue from there. So in 2015, under um, Governor Huck Hickenlooper, OREC was created. And, um, but it was a statutory um, codified office within the office of economic, uh, within the office of the governor, so it never was official. And um, so we just wanna make this an official office because we see the value of outdoor recreation in Colorado and we wanna encourage everyone to enjoy what, um, one of the best parts about Colorado, which is the, um, the outdoors. Um, they work with the outdoor retailer show and um, Somebody in the committee also asked what was the economic impact of the outdoor recreation on um, the show had on the outdoor recreation economy. So I just wanted to say that in the first two years that they relocated to Denver, the total economic impact exceeded $309 million and included over $231 million in business sales, $78 million in personal income, and the total tax revenue exceeded um, more than um, $10 million. So um, we just think it's been a really great um, avenue for um, economic recovery in all of Colorado. And um, I strongly support, um, encourage you to support this bill. Thanks, Representative Soper. Representative Soper. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Thank you, Representative McLaughlin. It's an honor to be part of this bill since both of us serve on the uh, Tourism Office's board. It's important to also understand the difference between outdoor recreation and tourism. The outdoor recreation uh, office, I, sh I should say, and tourism. What the office does is that they help promote uh, businesses engaged in the equipment, uh, manufacture and sale both in Colorado and outside of Colorado to help Coloradans engage in being outside. So this could be mountain bikes, it could be uh, fly reels, uh, it could be shoes for hiking, but certainly the outdoor uh, recreation office has been very successful and we would like to 
codify their existence into state law. And I would ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Any further discussion on House Bill 1223? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1223. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill 1223 is adopted. <laughs> Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to lay over Senate Bill 78, one bill. At the request of the Majority Leader, Senate Bill 78 will be laid over by one bill. Uh, Mr. Gregorio, please read the title of Senate Bill 102. Senate Bill 102 by Senators Buckner and Simpson, also Representatives Duran and Will, concerning the continuation of specific dental hygienist functions in connection therewith, implementing the recommendations contained in the 2020 Sunset Report by the Department of Regulatory Agencies. Representative Duran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move Senate Bill 102, and there was no committee report. To the bill, Representative Duran. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Senate Bill 102 is a sunset bill that allows dental hygienists to continue administering two cost-effective, minimally invasive procedures, interim therapeutic restorations and silver dynamine fluoride. These procedures are so important because they're painless, affordable, and they stop cavities in their tracks and prevent the progression of dental disease. They can also be administered in larger community or school-based clinics at a very low cost. With dental hygienists performing these procedures, patient outcomes have improved and our most underserved children, seniors, and rural Coloradans have access to quality, affordable dental care. This bill allows for dental hygienists to work with dentists over telehealth. That way, there's a dentist available for referrals and supervision of these procedures. This is really about access. Dental hygienists have been administering these treatments with great, acts, with great success, and we need to allow them to continue because it's in the best interest of Coloradans. With my 40 years of experience in the dental industry, I can attest to how important this bill is, and I ask for a yes vote for Senate Bill 102. Representative Will. I thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve you, sir. So I haven't had 40 years in the dental industry, <laughs> but I got a lot more years with dental. I've had teeth for 65 years, and I've had a lot of this work done. But this is a great bill, and as my co-sponsor said, it was a <clears throat> sunset bill, but these two procedures, the SDF and the ITRs, I heard from all my local uh, dental hygienists. This is, a, this is a great thing, and it, and it historically helps underserved populations and those in the rural areas. It's also inexpensive and cost-effective. So these, these procedures can keep a cavity at bay for 10, 12 years or whatever. So it's, it's a really great bill, and uh, all the dental hygienists and everyone supported it. It's a great bill. Ask for an I vote. Further discussion on Senate Bill 102. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 102. All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. Senate Bill 102 is adopted. Mr. Gregorio, please read the title of Senate Bill 78. Senate Bill 21-078 by Senators Jaquez, Lewis, and Danielson, also Representatives Sullivan and Herod, concerning the responsibility of an individual firearm owner to report a missing firearm. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move uh, Senate Bill 78 and the Judiciary Committee report. To the committee report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The Judiciary Committee uh, made some conforming amendments. I ask for an aye vote. Any further discussion on the Judiciary Committee report? Representative, no. Any further, any further uh, comments on the committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Judiciary Committee report to Senate Bill 78. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, aye. no. The committee report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I spent this uh, past weekend preparing my re remarks on Senate Bill 78 while the events of this past Monday were playing out around me. New reports were coming out, more information, and the first funeral was completed on Saturday. I thought back and forth with the idea that maybe one doesn't matter to the other, but I concluded that all Parts of our lives and decisions that we make are connected to one another. I often remember that Terry and I almost bought another house. I wonder often if we had bought that house instead of the one that we did, 
would things be different? Alex would have went to a different school. He would have had different friends. Maybe some different interests. He might have worked at a different job, went to another theater, and sat in a different seat. But he didn't. And I'm here talking to you. What I believe we are presenting today is an awareness bill. We know that the vast majority of Colorado gun owners already report to law enforcement when they become aware that a firearm has been lost or stolen. Data points that nearly 60% already do that. The problem with that is that a majority isn't good enough. Firearms are getting into the hands of those who shouldn't have them. Felons, those with mental health issues, and our youth. These firearms are stolen and in the more affluent areas and moved to the low-income communities. When a firearm is lost or stolen, it doesn't go away or disappear. It isn't eaten, consumed, broken, or in some other way become inoperable. It's just there, waiting to do what it was intended to do by whoever has it at that time. Nearly 40,000 Americans lost their lives in, to gun violence in 2019. 86% were males, the highest death rate in over two decades. One in 10 were children or teens. Firearms were the leading cause of death for American children, teens, and young adults aged 1 to 24. The majority of gun deaths, nearly two of every three, of every three is suicide. White men, white men, age 75 or older, were the highest, but men of color between 20 and 34 are on the rise. In Colorado, like most states, the rate of gun homicides is in the urban communities, but the overall rise of gun deaths was mostly felt in our rural counties. This was largely driven by the highest rate of firearm suicides compared to urban and suburban neighborhoods. In a recent CDC study of counties with the highest suicide rate in America, between 2015 and 2019, the top 20 listed Park County, Colorado in House District 60 with 29 firearm deaths with an average population of 17,796 per year. That would make the average 34.39 per 100,000. Gunnison County in House Districts 59 and 61 had 21 deaths with an average of 22.77 deaths per 100,000. They were rated as the 14th highest county in the United States. As I said, we need to do all we can to make sure that these firearms don't fall into the hands of the unintended. Reporting these will allow law enforcement to monitor where it's happening. They can take preventative measures to reduce these numbers. This would also allow that these crimes be properly prosecuted because lawyers could clearly prove that the criminal used a stolen firearm in commission of a crime. Lesser penalties are avoided if that has been reported. This bill would help to deter gun trafficking and straw purchasers. Should a given individual frequently have firearms found at the scene of a crime and say that they must have been lost without their knowledge, we have perhaps another problem. 
Without this mandatory reporting, we have little we can do otherwise. We had an amendment to try and ease the reporting information that is given to law enforcement. As stated, nearly 60% is already being reported. We heard this is the beginning of a registry in our committee. What about those 60% that are already doing it? None of them have had to register. None of, none of them have had anything confiscated from them. Why would this change what's going on already? This would only add more resources to law enforcement and help in our desire to save lives in our community. Thirteen states and the District of Columbia have already passed this type of bill. I look forward to the passage of Senate Bill 78. I hope that we, as a House chamber, are listening to the wishes of those who live in our districts. Keating Research published a report in January of 2019 that 87 percent support this legislation statewide, while only 11 percent are opposed to it. That has torn down the urban-rural wall or divide that we hear talked about all the time, because it's confirmed that 88 percent of both of those communities are in favor of something like this. Eight out of every ten Republicans in your district support this. And that rises to nine out of every ten households that own a gun in your district. This is the one, folks. This is the type of legislation that we should pass that makes that it would be a clear and decisive bipartisan manner to show the people of Colorado that we hear them, that the events of last Monday are a tragedy, and that we won't have to continue to live our lives like this. They can have hope that this body can work together to reduce the loss of life in this state by gun violence. We can't continue to prepare for funerals when we should be working together to address this health crisis. This health crisis in our state that is gun violence. I am asking all of you to vote yes for the passage of Senate Bill 78. Representative Harry. Or not, Representative Bockenfeld. <laughs> Mr. Chair, it's an honor to serve with you, as always. It's an honor to serve with you, sir. I understand Representative Sullivan's passion. I respect his passion. But there's a better way to accomplish what representative wants to accomplish. And that's not criminalizing legal gun owners. Let's do something positive. Let's start a marketing campaign if you want to increase the number of folks who are reporting lost stolen guns. Let's do a marketing, a positive marketing campaign to these folks so that they understand what the ramifications are, which I believe they do, by not reporting these guns. But there's a conflicting ideology. There are people in this country who are God-fearing, freedom-loving, Americans who feel strongly about their Second Amendment rights under the United States Constitution. They do not want a gun registry of any sorts and they feel this is a slippery slope. But Representative Sullivan, let's turn this into something positive. Let's take this 
bill that's dividing people in this country, and let's try to make this bill more palatable to everyone and still accomplish the end result that I know that your heart feels so strongly about that needs to be accomplished. I'll stand there with you. But creating laws and using the heavy hand of government to force people in this divided nation today to do what we're doing is not the right way. It's time we start pulling people in this country together. They want what you want. It's how we're getting there that's the difficulty. Thank you, sir, for your concerns and your heartfelt passion as to why you sponsored this bill, but I think there's another way, and I hope we can get there. Representative Ransom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, I think um, I agree with what my colleague just said about turning victims of crimes into criminals themselves, which is actually what this bill would do. If, as we've heard, most people do already report if, they, if, their ho if their home is broken into, property is stolen, most law-abiding citizens would already report. However, if for some reason they can't or don't, this bill would turn them into a criminal. It would actually criminalize and turn victims into criminals, which I hope is not what this body is all about. Think about folks that are actually victims of a crime, their home is broken into, they're injured. What if, they're, what if they were injured during the commission of this crime and then were actually having a bill saying that, well, we're going to now charge you with a crime because you've been injured, you didn't, the first thing on your mind was not to go run, look up all the serial numbers and figure out how to report this. So um, with that, I will, I move L020, which would, I'll talk about it in a second. Uh, we ask it to be displayed. I'm sorry? We asked for it to be displayed. Representative Ransom. I move L020 and ask that it be displayed. Amendment has been properly moved and is now displayed to the amendment, Representative Ransom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this amendment, if you see, it, it would make the bill not apply to a victim of a crime that has been injured during the perpetration of that crime. Obviously, you can see that this will generally be if a home is broken into, property is stolen, somebody is injured, the, the victim is injured, they would not then have to be charged with a crime themselves for failure to report if for some reason they can't or don't report the serial numbers that are missing. I ask for an I vote on this amendment. Further discussion on L020, Representative Sandridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I stand in support of this amendment. A lot of these bills, or this bill is very similar, I'm speaking of the amendment, um, in attacking our law-abiding citizens. But this bill goes forward, goes even a step farther. It attacks victims of crimes. This amendment, solves that issue. And let me, let me restate that again. The bill attacks law-abiding citizens, and it, may, and it even goes a little bit farther. It attacks victims of violent crimes as well. So, um, uh, uh, so I stand in support of this amendment because that resolves um, some of those issues. And I hopefully we, we can approve this amendment, um, unanimously agree on it, and actually move forward and hopefully have some discussions that discuss the perpetrator of crimes and not victims of crimes. So I ask, ask for an I vote. Thank you. Further discussion on L020, Representative Rich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you to uh, Representative Ransom for bringing this amendment. This is a very common sense type of, of amendment. 
uh, if someone is injured in their home and their gun is stolen, they may not have that information about that gun. And they might not be in a position for, you know, uh, before the five days is up to even report this if they're, if they're hurt, you know, in a bad way. So I think it's very reasonable, and I'd be surprised if you, want, if you were going to vote no on this, because there ought to be an exception to this, to this mandate. And I'm asking for support of L020. Thank you. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also agree this is very common sense legislation and a very important amendment. What if I'm in my home and I get burglarized? And in that burglary, I'm injured and hospitalized. What if I'm hospitalized for more than five days and I live alone by myself? I might be in the hospital a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month. Well, without amendments like this on this particular bill, which has many flaws, including this, then the person that gets out of the hospital and comes home and looks around his home after he has been released, finds that things have been stolen and he has firearms missing, is now a criminal. Who would do that? Who would promulgate legislation that would take people that are victims of crime and now make them criminals? Who would do that? Who would promulgate laws that make the innocent and those that are victims now have to answer legal charges? So ladies and gentlemen, we need amendments to this legislation. Now you can put your heels in and fight. You can push and say no. You can say, you know, representative, you don't know what you're talking about, but I will tell you, I know what I'm talking about. And I've given you a real example that could really happen to real people in Colorado. Well, you, because you want to promote this type of legislation, now we're going to make them the criminal and not the victim. Mr. Chair, members of this team body, you have to listen. You want us to listen to you, you need to listen to us. Thank you. Representative Carver, maybe. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I asked for a no vote on this amendment. Um, there's some provisions in this bill that I think ha will help to alleviate this concern, specifically that you have to um, become aware that the firearm was lost or stolen um, before you're required to report. Um, but if you are aware that it's lost or stolen, even if it's uh, lost or stolen during the commission of a crime, it's very important that law enforcement has this information that there was a firearm that was stolen. Um, sometimes the only intent is to actually steal that firearm, and we want to make sure that that's accounted for. So um, I appreciate the spirit of this amendment. A very much so. Um, we are not trying to play a gotcha or catch someone in the worst state. Um, so, and I think that's the mutual goal. Um, but I respectfully ask for a no vote on this amendment. I appreciate uh, the amendment sponsors for bringing it forward. Representative Carver. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, unfortunately, uh, the way the legislation is written by its terms, in fact, makes the victim potentially liable under this for um, penalties and being held to have violated the law. Because if the victim was injured and saw the individual steal the firearm, clearly that's the point at which he had knowledge, and now the five days start running, right? So uh, the victim is injured, family members are injured, people are in the hospital. None of that is accounted for in the current bill language. That's what this amendment would do, which is basic fairness that 
when individuals are recovering from injuries, and the, it was mentioned maybe the purpose of the burglary or crime was in fact to steal the firearm. And that was the point, and somebody was injured. Why in the world would you not account for that in the legislation so that the victim of this terrible incident is not going to turn around and be faced with uh, being charged in violation because they didn't report within five days. So I ask for an I vote on the amendment. Further discussion? Representative Holter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would welcome my colleague from Denver to point out in this particular legislation where it does say that uh, a person in the scenario that I described will not be held and charged, that they will be held harmless. Show me the language. In fact, just read it here in the well so we can understand it. As a country boy, I really need to understand it. Because I will tell you right now, the people in my house district are getting very tired. They're getting very tired of good, honest citizens being made criminals for things that they, not, they do not control. For example, if my home or my neighbor's home is burglarized, that is not my fault. I did not ask for that. My neighbor does not ask for that. But if it happens, the criminal act is the burden and responsibility of the criminal. But now, the innocent, the innocent has held liable those that have been criminalized. And that premise is grossly flawed. Grossly flawed in this legislation. Now, if you offer amendments that protect the innocent, then you may win over those who feel like they will be made criminals for an act that they, not, they did not ask for, but in this particular situation occurred in their lives. And oh, by the way, since you brought it up, oftentimes it takes days after a burglarization, it may take days, if not weeks, to look around your home and see what is missing. And oh, by the way, I believe, for those families that have experienced it, including my own, you may not know for days and weeks what is or is not missing. So what accommodation is made in that? So I ask the bill sponsors to step forward and make this very clear to us, because we don't see it in the bill. Thank you. Further discussion on L020. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L020. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. L0, L020 is lost. To the bill. Representative Ransom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And members, I do want to thank you for um, really listening to, the, to this prior amendment and the discussion that we had. I, I understand that um, there are different uh, feelings as we approach this bill and the tools that are used in the commissions of crimes. That being said, I feel very strongly that we really do need to recognize that the victims of a crime should not be made victims themselves. If they're injured, that was L020 that we just defeated. However, if the victim is hospitalized, there might be all kinds of ramifications to that, that if the victim or a member of his or her family is hospitalized as a result of that crime, this 
requirement should be waived. This bill should not apply, the reporting requirement should not apply if the victim or a member of his or her family is hospitalized. With that, I move L022 and ask that it be displayed. I mean, L022 has been properly moved. and is now displayed to the amendment representative ransom thank you mr chair so as you can see this amendment takes the previous amendment a step further and says the victim of the crime would need to be hospitalized or a member of his or her family would need to be hospitalized for this re reporting requirement to be waived. Remember, if you are a victim of a crime, you're in the hospital, you're trying to heal, you might be having all kinds of issues to deal with as the fallout of that crime and you're worried about a family member that's hospitalized that is who knows what kind of damage, physical damage, emotional damage has been done, they are hospitalized, and with that, the reporting requirement should not kick in, and I ask for an I vote on this amendment. Further discussion on L022, Representative Will. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair, and I, I strong stand in strong support of this amendment. Uh, it's happened in my lifetime and my career many times where vehicles, you'd have a vehicle wrecked, wrecked off in the ditch and firearms are stolen from them. Uh, people in rural Colorado wreck their pickup, might have a couple guns in the gun rack, a couple behind the seat, maybe roll down off the edge of the road. Uh, maybe just in the borrow pit, but a lot of times down off an embankment or whatever. takes a while for the tow trucks and all those to get there and do retrievals. And many, many occasions there's been firearms stolen out of those because those people got carted off to the hospital in an ambulance and had no knowledge of their firearms being stolen. Obviously the tow co companies try to keep any valuables and stuff that they find in the vehicles, but sometimes those disappear before they get retrieval of those vehicles. So I think this amendment really protects those type of situations, which do occur very often. So I stand in strong support of this amendment. Further comments on L022, Representative Rich. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to uh, stand up here and uh, ask for an I vote on this amendment. Again, I think it's a very common sense amendment. Uh, there's a lot of circumstances that happen, and I realize that in this bill it says that, you know, it's five days after discovering that the far firearm has been lost or stolen, but if they are in the hospital or if you have family members in the hospital, it ought to be a little bit clearer because when law enforcement, when you go and report this maybe a month or two later because you didn't realize that that gun had been stolen, you're going to have to probably end up going to court. And you were a victim of a crime that occurred in your house and there ought to be an exception and it ought to be laid out a little bit clearer than it is in this bill. So I'm asking for an I vote on this amendment. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once again, as I explained earlier, how in the world can we sit here in good faith and say we are going to create conditions through statute that criminalize the innocent through laws like this when the innocent are in fact victims? And if they are hospitalized, as this points out, then what remedy or allowance do you give them? Is the answer none for our bill sponsors? Is it none? You have no consideration for them. Well, I think the answer is none if you say no to any of these amendments, including this one. That is the message that I see when we bring forth honest, good faith amendments to protect those that need protected. <clears throat> I will tell you that here is the irony in all of this. This particular amendment here 
says that if a perpetrator of the crime caused bodily injury and the victim was hospitalized, that that particular section should not be enforced. Because how in the world will they have the situational awareness to determine what has been taken from their home? In fact, if you've ever had a serious injury, the last time I had a serious injury and was hospitalized for over a week, with multiple broken bones, it took me a week and a half to get out of the hospital and three months, three months to even get out of a chair and walk through my house including rehabilitation. So how in the world, and then when I do rehabilitate and come back to some semblance of normalcy, then you're going to place the burden on me to have the responsibility of inventorying my firearms and reporting this? Well, I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that be, might be the last thing on your mind as you try to live your life and recover as a victim you want to talk about victimization, you want to talk about taking care of victims, let's have a little consideration for my colleagues that are promoting, promoting this particular legislation. Representative Holter, I'd ask you to not walk up to the line of imputing the motives of anyone in the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your leadership. I will tell you that there are people in my district who are very strongly opposed to this, and there is an outcry that says, no, you cannot criminalize the innocent. Who wants to open that Pandora's box? Oh, wait, we already have. And now we want to open the door even more. Those of you that try to champion what you consider the victims Representative, you're di just directly discussing the, mo the, mo the motives of other folks and you're impugning them when you do that and there are rules against that. Please discuss yeah. the amendment and please don't discuss the motivations of anyone in the chamber. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll yield to the next speaker. Further discussion on L022, Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to be clear that if you are incapacitated, um, then you are clearly not required to report. Um, the bill, and, and I know that my colleagues can read the bill, um, does say once the owner knowingly, knowingly um, knows that the firearm is lost or stolen, then they must report. If you are inca incapacitated, that is a defense. But additionally, I want to note that the fine for this won't, won't the violation won't land you in court. <laughs> it won't mean you have to go through some lengthy court process. $25 fine for the first offense. $25. $25. I ask for a no vote on this amendment. For the discussion on L022, Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to point out to this body that the monetary number is irrelevant. Doesn't matter if it's a dollar, doesn't matter if it's 25 cents. The premise is flawed. The premise is, in fact, flawed. And this particular amendment tries to allow for remedy for the innocent, for those who are, in fact, victims that are hospitalized. Is there no compassion and care for them? This amendment tries to allow for that in the bill. But I will tell you, the amount of money does not matter. Just like the value of a life cannot be monetized. It cannot be quantified. But now we are going to quantify and monetize a crime that is imposed on a victim. Not a criminal, but a victim. And in most cases, an innocent victim who has their most sacred place broken into, which is their home, their castle, their safe space, where they're supposed to be safe. But now, if in fact the home is broken into, 
and firearms are taken, unbeknownst to them, there are conditions that are set that make them the criminal. Ladies and gentlemen, this amendment is a remedy for the victims. I would like to see the proponents of this bill really analyze and think about that situation. Let's not criminalize innocent people, even in the smallest sense. Representative Pico. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to make one correction to what was said a few minutes ago. For a first offense, it's $25, but if you happen to have that happen to you a second time, it's $500. That's a pretty stiff price for being an innocent victim and not being able to defend yourself uh, appropriately. It also, when you go through this process, it presumes that you didn't report knowingly. Let's not criminalize the victims. Representative Carver. Members, the, the point is not the dollar amount, as Representative Holtorf said. But when you think about just a, a regular person who has had their house broken into, a weapon has been stolen, they know about it at the time of the crime, they were injured, family members were injured, they're now seeking medical treatment, and what does the state of Colorado do if this bill is signed into law? Uh, they said, well, uh, gee, you've had a tough situation there. Here's your citation. Uh, you are now uh, deemed to have violated Colorado law. Yes, it's a petty offense. But now, in this situation, where because you did not report in five days, you are deemed to have violated the law, and that petty offense now goes against you. I hope you can see how deeply offensive and upsetting that would be to anybody in this situation. And why would we hold that they would be deemed in violation in this situation? How are you, if you accepted this amendment with your stated goal of it trying to encourage the reporting of stolen and missing firearms, how does accepting this amendment in any way undercut that goal? It doesn't. But this is not a situation that is remote. Many times when a home is being broken into and guns stolen, there may be injuries that occur. This is not theoretical. And are you really wanting to set a policy where the state of Colorado, as soon as the injured person gets out of the hospital, hand them a citation saying, well, because you didn't report within five days of when the crime occurred, you now have committed a petty offense. You have violated Colorado law. That makes no sense, members. Nor does it serve your stated goal on why you're running this bill. So I would ask for an aye vote on the amendment. Further discussion on L022. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L022. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. L002 is lost. To the bill. Representative Ransom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So members, we've been talking about why and how we're getting to the point of getting people to report to law enforcement if they are the victim of a crime. As we've agreed, most people will and do report to law enforcement when they are the victim of a crime. If they are injured or in the hospital, 
it may be a little bit tougher. Um, that being said, the amount of the fine is irrelevant. There are many of us who consider ourselves law-abiding citizens, try very hard to remain law-abiding citizens, and the idea of having a petty offense or a criminal charge of any kind, whether it's petty or a misdemeanor, would be horrifying to many of the people that I know in this chamber, in this Capitol building, and my constituents certainly, as well as many, many people in the state, do not want to have a, 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 an offense charged against them even if there isn't a fine, or if the fine's a dollar, or if it's $25. That, and also that being said, I think that there are crimes that happen. As we all know, there is evil in this world. There is. We've all seen it. I know the sponsors of this bill have seen it. I know I've seen it. I know that there is evil that happens, and there are bad people out there that take things from law-abiding citizens. And once again, I'll, I'll say that turning law-abiding citizens into criminals when they have been a victim of a crime themselves is just not good policy. Secondly, sometimes people are hurt very badly when they are victims of a crime. Sometimes they are members of a very horrifying class of homicide where they have been Clearly, they or a member of their family if, is a victim of homicide. And we're back to that then they would become, they would become criminals themselves if a member of their family was killed during the commission of this crime. So far, you've turned down the amendments that if someone's injured or if someone's hospitalized, that this would not the reporting requirement would not kick in. However, if a member of their family is killed during the commission of this crime, I would warrant that the reporting requirement should not be in our state law. With that, I will move L021 and ask that it be displayed. Amendment L021 has been moved and is properly displayed to the amendment representative Ransom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Clearly, if someone's killed, they cannot be making reports to law enforcement. I'm sure we all agree with that. However, if a member of their family was killed during the commission of a crime, I would, war I would say that there should be no requirement, no additional requirement for this victim to report. I can tell you from experience that when my family was the victim, and when my husband was killed, it was during a car crash, but it, there were still court appearances for, the, for not just us, but for the people that had caused the accident. It was a horrifying time in my life, and I can only imagine what people have gone through when there is an intentional murder as opposed to, as opposed to a, car, a car crash where it was unintentional that someone died. If there is a homicide during the, this crime where a firearm becomes missing, I would say that the victims or the victim's family should not all of a sudden become criminals themselves for failure to report. I, I heartily, I very sincerely ask for an I vote on this amendment. Representative Kirk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to because I, I care very much about accuracy, um, want to make it clear that I misspoke. While petty offense was in the first version, it's civil infraction. But to the ordinary person, what, what they're going to hear is that in this scenario, 
they have violated the law. They have violated the law even though uh, they were not acting with any intent to violate the law. They were dealing with their injuries. They were in the hospital. And so even though it is a civil infraction with a fine, they will have been deemed to act contrary to the law. And the previous statements about how horrified, maybe it seems like a small matter to members in this body, but to many, many uh, Coloradans who pride themselves and think it's part of being a good citizen not to violate the law, for them to be cited, even with a civil infraction, in a scenario where they have done nothing wrong. They understandably didn't report in five days. And this is a situation where it's going to be a gotcha moment. So I wanted to make that correction um, on the record. Accuracy does matter, or should and ask for an I vote on the amendment. Thank you, Representative Sandridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I stand in support of this amendment. Um, if we look at, and let me tell you why, if we look at the bill, the bill is, is an attack on law-abiding citizens. The amendment before this one attacked rape victims and victims of violent crime. This one protects homicide victims. And let me restate, the, the, the amendment before this protected victims of violent crime and rape victims associated with, with um, the selling of a firearm. So let's stand today and protect the victims of these crimes. Rape victims, homicide victims, victims of violent crime, law-abiding citizens. And again, maybe we can get to the point where we start focusing on the perpetrator and doing something about that. But it seems like we need more amendments like this because we're only focusing on victims and law-abiding citizens. And I think our community is watching us right now, asking first, what are we doing about the problem? And then why are we attacking them? So I have a feeling if we continue to go down this path of attacking victims, it's going to be a very long night. So I ask for a yes vote on this. Representative Holtor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, esteemed colleagues. I have a great deal of empathy for victims, a great deal of empathy as we all should. And we, as we promulgate laws, should put victims ahead of criminals. But this particular piece of legislation without this amendment or any amendment henceforth that protects the right of the victim does not meet that intent. I will tell you that in every case, in every case, ladies and gentlemen, the victim's rights should be held above the criminal's rights. In this case, as the language states, a perpetrator who, in this particular bill, is guilty of theft theft of a firearm. Now why would somebody steal a firearm? Let's be honest. 
The criminality is in the thief who stole the firearm. Not the victim who under this amendment he, she, or a family member has been killed, has been murdered. Their lives have been taken by a criminal. I find it very ironic that we will dig in our heels, that the bill sponsors will dig in their heels with this particular amendment on the table to protect those victims and say, vote no. I don't understand. I would like to hear an explanation, but I know that will not be forthcoming, I believe. But I will tell you that this is the highest level of crime that can be committed against the victim. And there should be, as this amendment here clearly states, there should be an allowance for that. As my colleague from Lone Tree offers very important and impactful amendments because she knows what loss is. Like others in this chamber, her amendments are sincere, they are honest, and they are to protect victims very much like her and her family. Victims of loss. Victims of death in their family. Caused by somebody who did a criminal and an illegal act or was callous or malice that allowed for that taking. That taking of a life which in our society's mores and every other society that I know, with few exceptions, the taking of a life is reprehensible and is not okay. So I ask, I ask the bill sponsors, where are we as a legislative body to protect the victims? Where are we? Where are we? for those that are victimized by the ultimate crime of homicide. Where are we? I ask for a yes vote without hesitation or reservation from everybody in this body to show empathy for the victims of a crime and not make the victim a criminal. no matter what level, no matter what monetary value. Innocent people should not be made criminals. Therefore, I ask for an I vote, Mr. Chair. I ask for an I vote from everybody in this caucus who has any level of empathy for those that have had a homicide conducted in their family at any time in their lives because in my humble opinion, it is the right thing to do. Representative Rich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I want to thank Representative Ransom for her thoughtful amendments, and I am sorry that, um, that two of these have not passed. I'm going to keep score here because if the victim is hurt, that, that fails. If the victim's hospitalized, that fails. But now if someone is killed, this bill really should not apply. It, it, and it's not laid out in this, this bill. There is no exception in this bill. They can, they can say all day long, well, you know, it's, it's as soon as you have knowledge. But if someone dies, who then is responsible for reporting a lost gun? The estate? So the estate becomes the criminal and you go after them? This is a common sense am amendment and I'm just asking for an I vote. Uh, there, there's no, we, we should care about the, the victim. We should care about their families. We shouldn't try to criminalize them. And I'm asking for an I vote on this amendment. 
Further discussion on L021. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L021. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. L021 is lost. To the bill, Representative Greitner. Thank you, Representative Gray. <laughs> so members, I just wanted to come up and talk a little bit about my objections to the bill. Um, and I think maybe the best way to just kind of start off is to just go ahead and run uh, Amendment L011 and ask that it be I move L011 and ask that it be displayed. Amendment L011 has been moved and is properly displayed to the amendment, Representative Gartner. Thank you, Representative Gray. And so members, what this amendment simply does is it says, hey, upon discover, or not discovery, but um, finding, locating said stolen or lost firearm that may have been reported by a law enforcement agency or organization, um, that that firearm be immediately returned to the property owner. Um, this is obviously a private property issue as well, um, but it also does highlight, unless that that firearm has been used in, in the commission of a crime, and then of course it needs to be retained for evidence and purposes until that case is adjudicated. So. Um, I would just ask for uh, a yes to L011. This, it's, it's a private property rights issue. So thank you for your support, members. Further discussion on L011? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone at all? Representative Soper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of this amendment. It's, it's a really good common sense amendment uh, to be able to get law enforcement to return the firearm to the property owner if it's not being used as evidence, obviously, in a criminal investigation. We all know that um, if you have your car stolen, uh, law enforcement, uh, when they're done with the investigation, will return the car. The same should be treated with firearms, and it's uh, really logical. A, a quick story that relates to this, uh, I had a good friend who had his car stolen. And actually, he, he had a, his firearm in the car as well. The person who stole the car proceeded to paint his white car uh, a dark color uh, with spray paint uh, when law enforcement found it. Of course, they took photographs. Uh, within a week, they returned his car to him, but they still have not returned the firearm. And it's really important that uh, law enforcement, when they are done with the investigation and the person is entitled to own the firearm, that they go ahead and return that back to the person who either had it lost or stolen. So this is a very, very good amendment, and I appreciate it being brought and fully in support. Thank you. Further discussion on L011? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L011. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. As opposed, no. L011 is lost. Brings us back to the bill and Representative Greitner. Thank you, Representative Gray. And so members, I have another amendment here um, that's just kind of, well, it makes sense. So I move L012 and ask that it be displayed. Amendment L012 has been properly moved and is now properly displayed to the amendment, Representative Greitner. Thank you, Representative Gray. And so members, the bill talks about uh, reporting into the Colorado Bureau of Information's uh, um, database. And so what L12 or 012 does is it basically says, hey, upon the return of the, of the firearm, upon the location of it, if it hasn't been used in a crime, well, then none of that information that was originally part of the report of it being lost or stolen should then also not remain in the database, right? Because I don't think what we need to do is create a database where we have uh, folks and their residents and their names and the weapons and whatever else when it's a, it's a settled matter at that point. It's no longer lost. It's no longer stolen. It's back with the property owner. It wasn't used in a crime. It's probably appropriate. It's highly appropriate to remove that information from the database. That's what L012 does, and I would ask for a yes vote. Further discussion on L012. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L012. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. L012 is lost. <laughs> Representative Greitner. Thank you, Representative Gray. And so members, I just wanted to also highlight something too, and we had some robust discussions about this. 
Um, and that is, is that there is a strong belief that actually a lot of this reporting of the lost and stole or lost or stolen firearm is actually already taking place. Um, so a scenario that we worked through is someone breaks into one of our homes. Um, the TV is stolen. Maybe the computer is stolen. Some cash is stolen. Maybe a firearm is stolen. That firearm does have a value associated with it. And anybody that has renter's insurance, anybody that has home insurance, anybody that has some sort of insurance, they will, in order to file a claim against their ins insurance, need to report and have a report filed through a law enforcement agency. And so in the scenario that, we just, that I just laid out, that TV gets reported to the law enforcement agency, the computer, the cash, and also the firearm. Because the owner of that property that had their property stolen needs to take that to their insurance coverage, their insurance provider, to say, this is the items that was stolen, the total loss that I have incurred. And the only way that you can do that is with a report. So therefore, weapons are already being, firearms are already being reported as lost or stolen. So I would argue that I don't think Senate Bill 78 is necessary. I'm not sure that it really serves anything because it's already being done. And so to further explore that, I actually went to my sheriff's office. So I live in El Paso, so I went to El Paso. And I asked this very question. I said, hey, are we already reporting firearms as lost or stolen? And they said, indeed, Representative Geithner, this is happening. Um, in 2019, we just looked at 19 and, and 20, uh, roughly 10 or so guns were uh, lost and then in 2019 stolen, there was approximately 300 or so. So each one of those already had a report associated with it. Each one. In 2020, lost was roughly 20, and then stolen was roughly 400. So that's coming out of El Paso County Sheriff's Office. And the purpose for this is because, well, obviously firearms do, they do have a financial value associated with it. And the very scenario that I just laid out is actually allows for what the bill is trying to do, it's already happening. And so, like I said, I think that the bill is actually unnecessary, um, and which is why I will be a solid no on the bill. Um, but kind of as we explored that a little bit, we also considered that, you know, the idea of some sort of a criminal charge or uh, something criminal being done because the bill allows for that it, on the second offense it becomes a misdemeanor we thought it wise maybe knowing that the reporting is already happening knowing that the bill is absolutely not necessary that uh, we have an amendment that may help a little bit of that so I move L017 and I ask that it be displayed amendment L017 has been properly moved and the race is on to have it be displayed. Oh, you're fine. <sighs> Representative Geithner, it isn't, the amendment is now properly displayed. Representative Geithner. Thank you, Representative Gray. And so members, what this does is it takes away that misdemeanor aspect because there is belief that this is already being done. In fact, I have already given you the evidence that it is being done. Now, I only contacted El Paso County Sheriff's Office. I'm sure that each of us took the time to contact our law, our, our law enforcement agencies. We too would also see um, that this reporting is being done. And so what L017 does is it simply removes that misdemeanor piece because it's already being done, right? And it leaves it as a civil infraction. Because why should we, you know, we're basically trying to attest that responsible gun owners are not doing something that they are in fact doing and therefore trying to find a way to bring forth criminal charges. This says, hey, 78 isn't necessarily needed, but in the event that it is, it's probably best to leave it as a civil infraction and not a criminal. So I would ask for a yes on L017. Representative Sandridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I stand in support of this amendment, and I go back to, to previous statements. In that list not make victims of violent crimes criminals, and that's what this bill does. Um, this brings it down to, a, to more of a civil matter. Um, people could be planning on funerals, dealing with mental health issues in the middle of these crimes or, or 
after these crimes are taking place, the violent crimes, they don't need to be worried about being labeled as a criminal. Let's respect the victims of these crimes and focus, and, and let's have some type of empathy here for people who've gone through life-changing victimization. I ask for a yes on this amendment. Thank you. Representative Sapir. Merci, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I also rise in support of this amendment. You know, having it be a misdemeanor, which is under the criminal code, makes criminals out of victims. And it's really important that we remember who's been victimized here. A person who has their gun stolen is not a perpetrator, but they are a victim of crime. Just like a person who has a car stolen is not a perpetrator, but they're a victim of crime. This amendment respects that because it moves it down into being a civil infraction, just like what the start of the bill has. The other thing that we need to keep in, in, in mind here is that it creates a chilling effect to make someone liable to a misdemeanor level offense. Because if your five days have expired, you are certainly not going to come forward at that point in time because now you're going to be the target of law enforcement, you're probably going to keep quiet at that point in time because these are pretty steep penalties. This is taking a sledgehammer to victims. What would be a better approach would be a carrot approach for victims. I mean, I can think of at least a couple of different ways that I would have rewarded uh, the bill to have a carrot approach to incentivize victims to be able to come forward. But the problem that I have that this amendment addresses is that if you're gone on vacation and you have no actual knowledge of your firearm being stolen, and, and you come back and, and the five days have already expired by that point in time, you're already guilty of something that you had no ability to prevent. And this amendment respects that. I would ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Further discussion on L017, Representative Holtor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, esteemed colleagues. I have the utmost respect for my colleague from Delta, and I respect his legal opinion. And I will tell you, I have a lot of people in my district that are good country folk that have never broken the law. Never. In fact, many of them have never even been in a courthouse. They drive by the jailhouse on the way to get groceries, but they've never been in it. They drive by the courthouse to go to the post office and get their mail, but they've never been in it. But without this amendment, without this amendment, what happens to my people? What happens to my people in southeast Colorado who are a victim of a crime? What happens to those people who now have a criminal record? based on this legislation. Doesn't matter if it's a felony or a misdemeanor. Because they don't even pay attention to those classifications because they're not criminals. And it's not what we say in our wheelhouse when we're good on as citizens and we're not even trying to be involved in any criminal activity. But now, with Senate Bill 21-078, without these amendments, particularly this amendment, now my people have the opportunity and the good fortune, thanks to the proponents of this legislation, to become criminals and get that criminal record. I don't understand. 
I don't understand how in the world, in this great state, we want to criminalize victims. Now here's the irony of all of it. We want to decriminalize felonious activity. We want to reduce sentences. We want to reduce charges. We want to offer cashless bonds. Without this amendment right here, it's conceivable that a person in my district who is victimized and their guns are taken, unbeknownst to them as the victim, unbeknownst to law enforcement because they might not even know, that the criminal who did burglarize the property, if that criminal is not caught with the stolen property, then that person could be released on a cash-free bond probably the same day as we rush to release criminals and separate them from any type of jail sentence for their crime and let them go back to the house. <clears throat> While the victim is now slated to become a criminal. With this amendment, ladies and gentlemen, there is no criminal charge. This gives you an opportunity to back out of a very bad place, I think, because I don't want to make victims criminals. I don't think that's the intent here of anybody, but we're going to do it without this particular amendment. That's what we're going to do here, as I see it. I could be wrong, and I'd like for somebody to explain that, how my logic is flawed. Please take that opportunity today if you can. Right now, a civil infraction is more appropriate. Because I will say people in my district do like to get places as quickly as they can, and they might speed. And they might get pulled over by the sheriff or the state patrol and commit a civil infraction of which they have to answer to. And they will either go to court or they'll send the money into the Department of Revenue and lose a few points on their license. But that's different. A civil infraction is vastly and grossly different from what this legislation is attempting to do. Attempting to make victims become criminals and have a criminal record. Representative Holtorf, we've talked about it publicly and privately. I need you to not discuss the motive of what people are intending to do. You just said this is what this is intended to do. It's not in the text of the bill. I spoke to you about it over there as well. Yeah. Thank There's you, There's a Chair. rule in this chamber against imputing the motives of other people. This is the third time that you've done it. I will continue to recognize you if you can follow that rule. Discuss whether the law is appropriate or not, but do not discuss the motivations of the people who are bringing it, please. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Chair. Once again, a civil infraction is the right answer, and this amendment is the right answer to correct what this legislation may do to the people of my house district who are not criminals in any way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Holtor. Further comments on L017? Representative Catlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It is a deep honor to serve with you, sir. Thank you. I've sat here this morning and listened to a lot of these arguments, and I, I'm, I'm coming down in favor of this amendment. You know, I think that if we can say to our citizens, look, we need your help. We need you to come in and talk about this. Then they may be willing to do that. If they're threatened with punishment, that's not a good way to get people that are good, solid people to participate. And one of the things that's concerning me is that we're not even mentioning in this bill anywhere that our police, our sheriffs, if they do investigate a robbery in a house or in a, on a farm, that they don't mention 
to the victim of that crime, listen, you've got five days to notify us if you notice something is missing. I think we're, we've taken this down a road that I, I really don't want to go down. I don't like the bill to begin with, but this amendment will help. It will help get good, solid people interested in possibly helping with this. I don't think they're going to like the idea, but at least they're not going to be punished. This is a good amendment. Vote yes. Any further discussion on L017, Representative Pico? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rise in support of this amendment. This makes sense. This, the whole point has, uh, of our objections has been we don't want to criminalize the victim. You don't want to take it out on someone who is a victim of a crime, which this bill does as it's written. This almost makes this a reasonable bill. I do not understand why you would not want to allow this amendment to go through. This is something we can talk about. Please take a look at it and ask, I ask for an I vote. Further discussion on L017. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L017 to Senate Bill 78. All those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. L017 is lost. That brings us back to the bill. Representative Will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you, sir. We've had a lot of discussion about this today, and I'll be brief here, but uh, in all due respect to the representatives who brought this bill, but I think it was mentioned earlier that, you know, like 80% of the people wanted this bill. I can tell you that the counties that I represent in rural and frontier Colorado, that over 80 percent of them do not want this law. So with that, I move uh, Amendment L024. Ask that it be L024 has been properly moved. <laughs> and is now displayed. To the amendment L024, Representative Will. I thank you, Mr. Chair. And all this does is that this uh, that this section does not apply to persons who reside in rural, a rural county or a frontier county in Colorado. Further discussion now, Representative Felton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and I rise in support of this amendment. Uh, there were some numbers thrown out earlier, and my district is all rural and frontier, and. It's the same as Representative Wills. 10 to 20 percent maybe want this bill. The rest do not. We're, we're just tired of it. So uh, I stand in full support of this amendment. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This amendment comes to where I live. I think this would be a good way to go about it because I think most of those weapons are stolen in bigger cities than they are in my district. This is a good amendment for rural Colorado. I ask for a yes vote. Representative Silver. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also rise in support of this amendment. As a rural legislator from Western Colorado, this is an excellent amendment and I appreciate it being brought uh, before us today. You know, certainly when we think about uh, why a person would uh, report a lost or stolen firearm, that's gonna be because uh, they're wanting insurance money or they want to catch the perpetrator or get their firearm back. All three of those are incredibly good reasons. But when you're in rural Colorado, especially if you've uh, been out uh, in different parts of the ranch, it may take you a long time before you get back home and notice anything different. And to have this bill in the language that it is apply universally, it seems like this is a problem that is an urban problem, not a rural problem. So that's why carving out rural Colorado and frontier Colorado makes sense. And I appreciate this amendment. Thank you. Apologies, members. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
as a rural legislator and one that continues to try to close the rural-urban divide. This amendment, I think, is a large step in that direction because urban Colorado is very different than rural Colorado. The ham that is urban Colorado does not fit in the glove that is rural Colorado. And the ham that is rural Colorado does not fit in the glove that is urban Colorado. And the first thing we need to do as legislators is make this recognition. So I'm in support of this amendment. It is right for my house district in southern and southeastern and eastern Colorado, the nine counties that I represent. So I strongly encourage a yes vote for L024, brought forth by my good colleague from Rifle, Colorado. Further discussion on L024? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of L024. All those in favor of L024, please say aye. Say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. L024 is lost. Back, we are back to the bill. Representative, I've got your Thanks. name wrong. Hanks, sorry. Representative Hanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sometimes anonymity is a good thing, so I'm not offended by that. Um, I'll be brief on this. Uh, some of the best briefings, some of the best uh, news reports are quick. And I'll start with the bottom line up front. I will vote against Senate Bill 21-078. The reason is, in our estimation, and I'm referring to my pro-Second Amendment constituents, this is another nose-in-the-tent effort by anti-gun activists. The um, prediction, the likely course of action, because we do know the playbook here, is if this bill gets passed, it will be followed with a registration law mandating all weapons are declared to the state that's what we oppose, and in order to do so, we oppose this bill. Thank you. Representative Oop. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I also oppose SB 21-078. Um, just in general, talking about gun laws that have been passed by um, earlier assemblies and also this assembly, um, we can go back to 2013 and look at high capacity magazine ban universal background checks. Um, now we have, of course, the red flag law. And since 2013, we actually have a 105% increase in deaths. Um, and I don't foresee that this law will, will help reduce those numbers whatsoever. I think we really need to study these facts and consider that none of this has uh, produced the result that, that has been looked for. Further discussion, Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you. Thank you. Uh, members, I rise in opposition to this bill. Um, there are a few things that I just want to address. I'm sure that we've all been receiving the same emails uh, from a few groups. Uh, one of them caught my, my uh, eye because it referenced the study, and I believe the bill sponsors also made reference to the study, uh, citing a 30% reduction in firearm-related crime due to, due to bills like this. And that really stood out to me because I thought that that would be something that would have gotten a little more attention to that. So I looked into it, um, and unfortunately, members, the facts just don't bear it out. Uh, the study that was referenced is done by a guy named Daniel Webster from John Hopkins. It was in 2013. The study was funded by Michael Bloomberg's organization. I think he's made no bones about where his particular opinions lie on this. But the more important part is that this study did not meet methodological standards to be included in meta-studies and other publications because it tested multiple laws in the same study. So this didn't, for instance, if you go to the Rand Corporation's comprehensive meta-study that they do, it's a running study on gun violence and gun violence policy. It was last updated in April of last year. They specifically, I'm just going to quote here, found no qualifying studies showing lost or stolen firearms reporting requirements increased or decreased any of the eight outcomes that they investigate. The outcomes that they investigate amongst them are suicide, unintentional injury or death, violent crimes, mass shootings, et cetera. 
So I just want to kind of put that to rest. Uh, you know, I know that people like to say the facts bear this out a lot in this building. In this case, the facts just don't bear it out. There's no, there is no scientifically valid study that shows that there is any significant impact on crime due to laws like these. Another thing, and this is just more broadly to the bill, you know, members, I just, I have a really hard time believing why we're singling out firearms as the only thing that we are now going to make a crime to fail the reporting of. In this country, in 2018, this is the last year that was available, there were just shy of 14,000 deaths that involved, homicide-related deaths that involved firearms. There were just shy of 68,000 deaths that involved opioids. So members, with, with those kind of numbers, where there are almost five times as many deaths that involve opioids, a controlled substance, and we're not gonna make that a crime if your opioids are stolen in this state, there's no crime, there's no punishment if you don't report that, and that happens all the time. Drug diversion, I mean, how many bills have we passed in the last two years alone aiming at that problem? But yet we're not down here arguing that people who have their drugs stolen should have to report that, even though it causes five times more death in this country. So members, it's, it's just troubling because yet again we are here with a bill that just singles out firearms. And people who go and purchase these weapons for self-defense or for recreation are feeling attacked relentlessly because they are constantly singled out. There were more than 8 million people last year that went and purchased firearms for self-defense because of a lot of the activity that was going on last summer. People did not feel safe. And now they're being deluged and stigmatized for that decision. And members, I just don't think that that's fair. So members, again, and, and a lot of my colleagues hit, hit the nail on the head, this bill is making a victim a criminal. And that is so anathema to the vast majority of bills that we pass down here. And again, I just wonder why is the exception always firearm bills? So with that, members, I stand in strong opposition to SB 78. And I urge you all to vote against it. Thank you. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you, serve with you sir. So we all come down here to try to make a difference and try to do good things. Sometimes those, those intentions are misplaced. Guns don't kill people. People kill people. That's what we have to keep in mind. And by us turning innocent owners of firearms into criminals, we do more harm than we do good. We, we can make a difference down here. We really can. But it's not going to be by attacking a constitutional right of our citizens, and that's the Second Amendment. One of the things that bugs me, uh, especially about this bill, is that we, uh, just last week or week before, they're kind of blending together, we passed House Bill 1106. What 1106 did was said that if your firearm is not secured properly, you're a criminal. So we've already taken good, responsible gun owners and made them criminals. Now, knowing that if your firearm is not locked up, you will be less excited about turning in the fact that it got lost or stolen because it wasn't locked up right. So now you kind of have a double whammy going on here. And we just continue to pound and pound and pound on our citizens by creating prohibitive laws. Once again, guns don't kill people, people kill people. And at some point, we have to actually tackle the issue that we really have going on, and this is a mental health crisis in this state. I hope we can put as much vigor and as much excitement as we do into trying to destroy constitutional rights of our citizens into trying to help them, truly help them, and get the mental health aid that we need to to get people to a position where they don't have to turn to guns for violence against themselves or violence against others. Colleagues, I'd, 
I would encourage you to, to really think about what we're doing to our Constitution with bills like this. And I plead with you uh, to vote no on this bill. Thank you. Representative Bradfield. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just feel the real need to uh, let everybody in this body know that uh, uh, I will vote no on this bill. I heard from uh, both sides of the aisle that uh, this year we were, this session was going to be a session of compromise, work together, you know, be reasonable. And the discussion today, um, I haven't felt uh, a compromise was uh, uh, was accepted, and uh, that disappoints me. I think we could do better than that. I think uh, we're bigger people than that. Um, I think we have better hearts than that. And um, I think after this three-day break, I think we should come back and be better people. Thank you. Representative Pico. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to address some of the things that are that are in this bill, and it's been said many times and, and bears repeating over and over and over again, which is this is criminalizing the victim. But more often than that, it's focusing on the guns, which is merely a tool. It isn't focusing on the fact that people are what is the issue, and that was addressed a little bit earlier. But I want to go down that. 40,000 deaths, I think, per year was the number that I heard earlier. A very significant part of those was suicides. Stolen or lost guns have very little to contribute to a suicide. During my time on active duty, during my son's times on active duty, we've, we've seen suicides. I lost too many people that I knew personally to suicide. Those that I knew, those that my sons have known, we lost a dozen, we've seen a dozen people commit suicide. Less than a fourth of those were with firearms. The problem is a mental health issue. The problem of crime is a crime issue of people. It isn't the gun. A gun is an inanimate object, it's a tool, and there are many, many others. Other countries have cracked down on guns and the, and the criminals just go to something else. Now in England, it's knife control. So what's next? Are we going to register table knives? Are we going to report to the police lost table knives? This just, just opens up to nothing. The issues are crime or mental health. A lot of the discussion was about how many youth, how many youth are killed by gun violence. They're not killed by guns. They're killed in gangs. They're killed by criminal activity. That's where the problem lies. They're killed in the inner cities. Gang violence in inner cities is an epidemic. That's the issue, not the tools that are used. And far, and, and an awful lot of those are killed by knives, not guns. The issue is crime. The issue is mental health. It isn't the tools that are at hand. There'll be a tool at hand. This is, this is a bad bill. It criminalizes the victims. It criminalizes possession of a gun. It's going down that path that, that we really shouldn't go down. Let's turn our attention to what the real issues are, mental health, real issues of crime, and what, does, what, does, what starts that and what the function is. Let's take this bill back and, and work at something that, that we can accept, that we can work on together. The amendments that have been tossed up here have been very substantive, good bills, good amendments to a bad bill that could make this bill at least workable. But they've all been rejected because, well, you can. I asked you to, let's, let's put some attention to it. Let's address the real problems of crime, mental health, not the tools. I ask for a no vote. Representative Will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Truly an honor to serve with you. It remains an honor to serve with you, sir. So I got to say, I have uh, I read this bill, I couldn't tell you how many times, multiple times, 
and I never could figure out what the bill was truly trying to accomplish. I think it does nothing for the public good. And I read and read through it. I see where it does nothing for the public good. When you know, when, when we create law down here, my members, I mean, we, I think we're trying to correct a problem or, or create some kind of cure to that problem. And I just can't determine that in this bill. I don't determine the basis and purpose of this bill. Uh, for me, it, there, there isn't, you know, there just isn't a need for it. Um, so to me, this, this bill makes about as much sense as requiring the person or the thief that stole the gun to report his or her theft within five days. I could get behind a bill like that. Um, but, but criminalizing law-abiding citizens just because they were victimized by a thief I just can't get behind. So with that, I'd like to move amendment L026 and ask that it be displayed. Amendment L026 has been moved. Thank you. And is properly displayed. Representative Will, would you like to tell us what your, what your amendment does? Representative Will. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. It, uh, it strikes an enabling clause of the bill. Thank you. Any further discussion on L026? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L026. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye! <laughs> those opposed, no. No! L026 is lost. Representative Carver. Members, I rise in opposition to the bill. And uh, for the fundamental reason that I think this actually will result in less reporting than more reporting. And here's why. Uh, I've had uh, conversations with various folks in my community, and uh, many who are not uh, strong Second Amendment advocates. Uh, they may have a family member with a gun. This is not uh, maybe their issue. And they say, well, what about the firearm owner who will report but it may be later than five days. Is that firearm owner knowing that now if they report, they're going to be held to a violated Colorado law, will decide not to report, not to put themselves in that position? So I think the way this bill is structured, uh, you could very well end up with less reporting, not more. And sometimes if you want to encourage an activity, uh, you use the carrot approach, which is what a number of states have done, where they have said, if you report a missing or stolen firearm, uh, you will have uh, immunity from any civil or criminal liability. Uh, that's the how you incentivize, uh, encourage more of that behavior. But when you punish behavior, and if for whatever reason, and you can come up with all different kinds of scenarios where for whatever reason, the individual uh, did not, it wants to make the report, intends to make the report, but it doesn't happen within five days. Are they going to reconsider whether to make the report because they'll be now deemed in violation of this new law? So uh, I think, uh, I think it's good I think encouraging people to report missing and stolen firearms is a worthy goal. It enhances public safety. It uh, is the right thing to do. We should encourage it. We should support it. 
I just think you are not going to get that result with this bill. And so I ask for a no vote. Representative Holdsworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair, esteemed colleagues. There are many proponents of gun control, gun rules, gun regulations, gun registration that truly believe that more gun laws will reduce violence. Yet another gun law was Senate Bill 21078, lost or stolen firearms. Now let's talk a little bit about that premise. <clears throat> In Mexico, the country of Mexico, they have some of the strongest gun laws in many nations, yet they have some of the highest murder rates and the highest levels of violence in the Western Hemisphere, certainly in North America. Now I'm going to drill this down a little bit. <clears throat> Let's talk about our own country. How about the city of Baltimore? The city of Baltimore has some of the most stringent gun regulations and rules of any city in this nation. Yet, they have one of the highest levels of gun violence of any city. Is it because the gun laws are curtailing the violence? Obviously not. Obviously not. And the representative that preceded me made a very good point. <clears throat> now let's talk about another city. We want to talk about violence, violence in America. How about the city of Chicago? Another city that has some of the strongest gun laws, gun rules, gun regulations in the nation. Yet the level of violence is some of the highest in the nation, week after week, month after month. Where is the outcry? Where is the outcry in that city? Where is the outcry? The level of gun violence is so high in this city, and it's been reported, and is statistically known, but yet they have some of the highest gun laws. So as we in Colorado want to promote more rules, more laws, more regulations, allegedly to stop this heinous and criminal activity. Statistically, it is proven, it is proven that that logic is grossly flawed, not only internationally, but domestically in our own country. Now, my daddy always told me, growing up, more laws make criminals out of all of us. And every day in this gold dome, that statement is reinforced in my mind. <clears throat> because now the good people in eastern Colorado are going to be made criminals by more laws. Failed policy that will not change. So if we don't get amendments that really address the issue, if we don't get concessions that really address the issue, this is going to be a long day, a long night, and I welcome the sun when it comes up in the morning as I'm standing in this well continuing to address what we're talking about today. 
And I'm not kidding. I wonder if anyone has any amendments to offer. I wonder if any amendments are available. Well, hello. <laughs> Representative Neville and Representative Geithner. Who'd like to go? Representative Neville. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And members, there are some concerns that we have with the bill, but uh, I think this, so therefore I move L029 and ask for it to be properly displayed. Amendment L029 has been moved and is properly displayed. To the amendment, Representative Neville. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And members, the amendment really does kind of three things, so I'll talk about the first two and then let Representative Geithner talk about the third one. So the first thing to do, first thing it does is it allows not just the owner to make the report, because there might be a situation, say, I'm overseas uh, working for a long period of time and something happens in my house, it allows a family member or someone who resides with me to make that as report as well and satisfies the owner's requirement under this law. And then two, it also um, allows the owner not to have to admit that he owns the firearm. So we don't want to have a situation where maybe they aren't legally able to own a firearm so they choose not to report it to get in trouble. We want it to be reported. And then I personally don't want to admit to the government that I have firearms. So as someone like me could report lost or stolen, which is probably the right thing to do, but then I don't have to actually report that. And then for the third thing, I'll... Representative Gardner. Thank you, Representative Gray. And so members, the final thing that the amendment does is it actually addresses the concern around someone making a report of something that is, or of a firearm that is lost or stolen. And then you can all naturally guess that the, maybe the next question will be, well, how did you have it secured or, so in, or something to that nature? So this amendment would remove uh, the criminal prosecution for an offense uh, related to uh, it, it properly being stored if it's being reported as lost or stolen so that there isn't that self-incrimination piece um, that's there. And so uh, I, I rise in support of L029 and ask for an I vote from the body. Representative Herod, do you have anything to say about this amendment? <laughs> Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, I ask for an aye vote on this amendment. I want to thank uh, my colleagues from the other side of the aisle for working so hard uh, to ensure that we are actually speaking about the same thing um, and providing the right protections where needed. Um, I think this is a really good amendment. It's a surgical amendment. Uh, it gets to kind of what our, our goals are, which is to ensure that firearms that are lost or stolen are reported. Um, I ask for an aye vote. Further discussion on L029. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L029 to Senate Bill 78. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. L029 is adopted. We are back to the bill. Any further discussion on Senate Bill 78? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Senate Bill 78. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Senate Bill 78 is adopted. Mr. Gregorio, please read the title to Senate Bill 121. And I would invite Representative Bockenfield to come on down. Senate Bill 121 by Senator Hansen and Priola, also Representatives Bockenfeld and Byrd, concerning modifications to the revised Uniform Unclaimed Property Act. Representative Byrd, why don't we start with you? Representative Byrd. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate Bill 121. To the bill. Representative Burke. Yes, um, thank you again, Mr. Chair. So today, members, um, Senate Bill 121, we have before you, it's a necessary piece of legislation that gives better protection to consumers in our state and also enables more efficient common sense management of unclaimed property here in Colorado. Specifically, the bill defines a financial organization loyalty card and exempts it from the act's current definition of property, specifies activities by which the owner of a demand, savings, or time deposit may rebut the presumptions of abandonment, and permits delivery of that property to be delayed in order to avoid penalties or foreclosure. It also repeals the requirement that the state's treasurer's record of people entitled to property be available for public inspection. This is to prevent against identity theft and allows a property owner's address to be published if it may help in returning the property. So this is pro-consumer, good government bill. I respectfully ask for a yes vote. Representative Bockenfeld. I'm speechless. Oh, it's an honor to serve with you, Mr. Chair. It is Chair. an honor to I'm serve with you. I'm speechless. My colleague did a fabulous job describing this bill. I ask for an I vote. 
Further discussion on Senate Bill 121. Seeing none, the question before us is the option of Senate Bill 121. Good. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. no. Senate Bill 121 is reluctantly adopted. Mr. Gregorio, please read the title of House Bill 1187. House Bill 1187 by Representatives Young and Pelton, also Senators Winter and Rankin, concerning the implementation of case management redesign to ensure conflict-free case management for members eligible for long-term services and supports under the Medicaid program. Excellent. Representative Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move the committee report and House Bill 1187. Uh, to the committee report. Uh, in the committee, we, we had a, a pretty big amendment. Uh, <coughs> the amendment uh, makes several tweaks to the bill based on feedback from Alliance, the county single entry points, and Department of Human Services. Uh, it amended the de definition of a community center board to ensure continuity of local mill levy dollars that currently go to community center boards. Uh, it added a requirement that in their competitive solicitation for new case management agencies, the department must include a fiscal analysis to determine if additional funding is needed to mitigate impacts of the redesign. And the last was clarifying land language regarding CDHS and the certification of early intervention service providers to ensure the bill does not limit or exclude CCBs or CMAs. Any other, cover any other discussion on the committee report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services Committee report on House Bill 1187. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The committee report is adopted. To the bill, Representative Young. We've had a long morning of listening, but if you share my interest in reducing or eliminating the wait list factor for individuals with developmental disabilities, please pay attention to the elements of this bill. It is a case management redesign bill. And the Department of Healthcare Policy and Public Finance it really went beyond the original um, scope of what we needed to have in this bill to get eliminate conflict-free case management. And what was happening in the state is that case management agencies were also providing services. So this bill corrects that conflict. It will no longer happen unless you live in a frontier community or a community that doesn't have agencies that can provide both. But the department went way beyond, as I said, and has designed a case management agency which eliminates the silos as people try to access waivers in order to meet their needs. Up to now, people frequently ended up on the wait list because the rules didn't allow them to receive the mental health services or the living services that they needed. And this current bill will allow people to remain in their communities and now receive the services they need, ending up either reducing or eliminating the need for a wait list. I urge an I vote. Representative Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, in my previous uh, experience as a county commissioner, uh, I was, I really wanted to be on this bill so I could help make sure rural wasn't left out and, and uh, the community center boards weren't left out. So some of the things that, to help rural with this bill is uh, that it will also help protect access to services in rural communities by ensuring adequate capacity. This will ensure every area of the state has case management service provider with expertise in these waiver programs. And without this legislation, the department would have to open up case management to any qualified case management provider, making access to services more complicated by la adding layers to the system and complexity for members and families. So, so with that, I think uh, both urban and rural Colorado will be served well with this bill. So I'd ask for a yes vote. Further discussion on Senate, I'm sorry, House Bill 1187. 
Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1187. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Aye. House Bill 1187 is adopted. <laughs> Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the committee rise and report. Seeing no objection, at the motion of the Majority Leader, the committee will rise and report.
House will come to order. Mr. Gregorio, please read the report of the Committee of the Mr. Whole. Mr. Speaker, your Committee of the Whole begs leave to report it as under consideration. The following attached bills being second reading thereof makes the following recommendations there on House Bill 1187 as amended. House Bill 1218, House Bill 1223 passed on second reading and ordered and grossed and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senate Bill 78 as amended, Senate Bill 102, Senate Bill 121, Senate Bill 122 passed on second reading and ordered revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Representative Gray. You have heard the motion. There are amendments at the desk. Mr. Gregorio, we'll start with the ransom amendment. Mr. Gregorio, please read the ransom amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Representative Ransom moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee, not adopting the following ransom amendment, L021 to Senate Bill 78 to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 78 is amended passed. Representative Ransom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the ransom amendment and ask for an aye vote. That has been properly moved and displayed. Is there further uh, discussion on the ransom amendment? <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, Mr. Gregorio, the question before us, members, is the adoption of the ransom amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. For those participating remotely, Representative Michelson Janay, how do you vote? No. Representative Michael Sinjane votes no. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? No. Representative Jackson votes no. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? No. Representative Snyder votes no. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? No. Representative McLaughlin votes no. Representative Benavides, Cutter, and um, Right. Uh, Representative Tipper is excused. Please close the machine. With 26 aye votes, 36 no votes, and three excused, the ransom amendment to the report of the committee of the whole is lost. We will now move to the representative will amendment to the report of the committee of the whole. Mr. Gregorio, please read the will amendment to the report of the committee of the whole representative will move to amend the report of the committee of the whole to reverse the action taken by the committee not adopting the following ransom amendment l024 to senate bill 78 to show that said amendment passed and that senate bill 78 is amended passed representative will thank you mr speaker i move the will amendment to the committee of the whole and ask for an aye vote please you have heard the, thank you. That has been properly moved and the amendment is displayed. Is there further discussion on the will amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the will amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. For those people participating remotely, Representative Michael Sinjane, how do you vote? No. Representative Michael Sinjane votes no. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? No. Representative Jackson votes no. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? No. Representative Snyder votes no. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? No. Representative McLaughlin votes no. Representative Kip and Sirota. Please close the machine. With 24 aye votes, 38 no votes, and three excused, the will amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole is lost. We will now proceed to the Geithner amendments. Mr. Gregorio, please read the first Geithner Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Representative Geithner moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the Committee, not adopting the following McKean Amendment, L011 to Senate Bill 78 to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 78 is amended passed. Representative Geithner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I move the first Geithner Amendment to the Committee of the Whole and ask for an aye vote. Is there any further discussion on the first Geithner Amendment? Seeing none. The question before us, members, is the adoption of the first Geithner Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. For those participating remotely, Representative Michael Sinjane, how do you vote? No. Representative Michael Sinjane votes no. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? No. Representative Jackson votes no. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? No. Representative Snyder votes no. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? Yes. Representative McLaughlin votes yes. Representative Bockenfeld, Harrod, Hooten, Lantine, Ricks, Exum, and Ortiz. Please close the machine. 
with 29 aye votes, 33 no votes, and three excuse the first Geithner Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole is lost. Mr. Gregorio, please read the second Geithner Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Representative Geithner moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the Committee not adopting the following McKean Amendment, L-012, Senate Bill 78, to show that Senate Amendment passed and that Senate Bill 78 is amended passed. Representative Geithner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, I move the second Geithner Amendment to the Committee of the Whole and ask for an aye vote. Is there any further discussion on the second Geithner Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole? Seeing none. The question before us is the adoption of the second amendment, second Geithner Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Michelson Janae, how do you vote? No. Representative Michelson Janae votes no. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? No. Representative Jackson votes no. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? No. Representative Snyder votes no. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? No. Representative McLaughlin votes no. Representatives Woodrow, Hooten, Kip, Exum, Geithner. Please close the machine. 26 I votes, 36 no votes, and three excused the third Geithner Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole, or second Geithner Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole is lost. Mr. Gregorio, please read the third Geithner Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Representative Geithner moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the Committee, not adopting the following McKean Amendment, L017 to Senate Bill 78 to show that said amendment passed and that Senate Bill 78 is amended passed. Representative Geithner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I move the final Geithner Amendment to the Committee of the Whole and ask for an aye vote. Is there any further discussion? And I should probably be saying Assistant Minority Leader. Sorry about that, Representative Geithner. Is there any further discussion on the Geithner, third Geithner Amendment to the Report of the Committee of the Whole? Seeing none. The question before us is the adoption of the third Geithner Amendment to the Report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Michelson Janae, how do you Michelson vote? Michelson Janae, how do you vote? No. Representative Michael Janae votes no. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? No. Representative Jackson votes no. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? No. Representative Snyder votes no. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? Yes. Representative McLaughlin votes yes. Representative Benavides and Exum. Please close the machine. With 27 aye votes, 35 no votes, and three excused, the third Geithner Amendment to the report of the committee of the whole is lost. Members, that brings us to um, the report of the committee of the whole, because there's no further amendments. The question before us is the adoption of the report of the committee of the whole. Mr. Gregorio, please open the machine, and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Michelson Janae, how do you vote? Representative Michelson Janae. Yes. Representative Michelson Janae votes yes. Representative Jackson, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Jackson votes yes. Representative Snyder, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Snyder votes yes. Representative McLaughlin, how do you vote? Yes. Representative McLaughlin votes yes. Representative Benavides, Cutter, and Ricks. Please close the machine. With 40 aye votes, 22 no votes, and three excuse, the report of the Committee of the Whole is adopted. I believe that brings us to announcements and introductions. Representative Byrd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So Finance Committee, we've got a meeting today. Um, upon adjournment, let's make our way down to Committee Room 0112. Today, we will be considering for action only House Bill 1105. And then we'll be hearing bills and voting on them, of course. Um, House Bill 1104, 1043, and Senate Bill 145. So please, as soon as we adjourn, make haste, and we'll get some good work done. I have a quick announcement. Representative Pelton will replace Representative Van Beber on energy and environment for today only. Representative Arndt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of Agriculture, Livestock, and Water Committee, we will meet uh, directly upon adjournment and hear one bill, uh, 1226. Thanks. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of the Appropriation Committee will be meeting on Monday at 9.30 to hear House Bill 1006, 1084, 1099, 
1181, and the Old State Library at 1130. Representative Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Business Affairs and Labor Committee, we are meeting at 1.30 today, or if finance is going long, whenever finance is done in room 112, we will hear House Bill 1207, 1224, and 1134. Representative Aval does. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just a reminder, House Energy and Environment is meeting in 271 today. The Old State Library at 1.30, be there or be square. Representative, Representative McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, House Education, we are meeting um, at 1.30 today, or as close to that as we can. We're listening to Senate Bill 56, House Bill 1133, and House Bill 1173. We'll see you there. Thanks. Thank you, Representative McLaughlin. Uh, Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of State, Civic, Military, and Veterans Affairs, we're meeting upon adjournment. Um, let's just do 10 minutes after we get out of here over in LSBA to hear House Bill 1236. Representative Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, tomorrow is the 454th Friday since my son Alex and A.J. Boyk were murdered with 10 others in the Aurora Theater massacre. Uh, da Vinci said, and I quote, I have been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. I ask that we prepare to do something. Thank you. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We deal with hard topics in this building. We are the tip of the spear. We set the standard. We set the standard for civil discourse. We set the standard for problem solving. We model for our people what it looks like to honorably live, work, and interact with others who think markedly different than we do. To best effectuate this, we must fight the temptation of believing the worst of each other when we disagree. When I say to you every week that you are amazing and loved, worthy, and adored, I mean that with all of my heart. It is not a show. And I hope that as you look around this room, if you cannot say the same for every person you see, you will do the hard thing and you will go to them and you will have lunch or coffee or conversation because I genuinely believe that while we have different answers to the problems our people face, every person in this room, whether elected or staff, has a heart of gold. You do not put yourself in situations like this where you are criticized out there without it. And so once again, on this weekend, this weekend when many celebrate Love conquering all, light conquering darkness. You will take time to reflect and to ask yourself, can you say about the people we work with that they are loved and adored, amazing and worthy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Luck. See no further announcements or introductions. We will proceed to work. Uh, Mr. Gregorio, reports to committees of reference. Committee on Health and Insurance. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends fund House Bill 1202 be postponed indefinitely. Committee on Transportation and Local Government. After consideration on the merits, the committee recommends fund House Bill 1139 be amended as follows and be so amended be referred to the committee the whole favorable recommendation. House Bill 1168. Be amended as follows and be so amended be referred to the committee on Finance with favorable recommendation. House Bill 1235 be referred to the committee the whole with favorable recommendation. Printing report. 
printing report, report will be you... printed in the journal. Signing of bills, resolutions, and memorials. The speaker Sign has bills. signed. Resolutions and memorials will be printed in the journal. Message from the Senate. Mr. Speaker. Message from the Senate will be buried in the journal. Message from the revisor. We here with transmit. Message from the revisor will be printed in the journal. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, thank you so much for your hard work today. Um, I think I'll go ahead and give you tomorrow off. Um, just kidding. We were already planning on that. But thank you, those of you who do have tickets for the Rockies game. Enjoy opening day. I didn't think any of us would get there. But with that, Mr. Speaker, I ask that the House stand in recess until later today. Um, I heard you moved that, right? I move that the House stand in awesome. recess until later today. Uh, great. I see no objection. Uh, Everyone have a great uh, weekend. The house will stand in recess until later today.